Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 211, highlights from Origins 2023. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record this show live at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and it'd be great if you join us. So as anyone who follows our social media feeds will be well aware, we're just getting back from the Origins Game Fair, a game convention held annually in Columbus, Ohio. Tonight's episode is going to be all about that game convention. Now, if somehow this is your first episode ever of the Tabletop Hop Gaming Podcast that you've checked out, just be aware that this isn't our usual format. Normally, after some fan feedback, we answer a game or game night question, review one or two games, and talk about the games we've been playing. Now, we'll be getting back to that format next week, where we'll be answering a question about cooperative board games. Before we move on, remember that you can always find the links to the games and other things we mention during this show in our show notes. You can find the show notes for this episode at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 211. Let's start things going with a quick trip to the Suggestion Box. Welcome to this week's Suggestion Box. So we don't have any specific word-for-word feedback or quotes or letters we received. Instead, what I wanted to do this week as part of our Origins recap is to take a bit to thank everyone we ran into at the con for their kind words and encouragement. It was heartwarming. To run into fans, both among attendees and publishers. Yeah. Now, a number of publishers praised us for a variety of things, including the depth of our reviews. The fact we talk about who should buy the games, that was a huge selling point to many of them. Even if these games aren't for us, that is one of the things they really seem to appreciate. And we got a lot of comments on our professionalism, which please ignore the unboxings I tried to do yesterday as far as that one's concerned. Uh, Many publishers were completely blown away and extremely appreciated that when we noted that we try to try every game we review about five times. And I thought it was really cool that everyone seemed to love our new bellhop shirts. I thought that was amusing. That seemed to go go well, actually wearing these. We even had one publisher ask how big our team was like, oh, so you're like the PR people. How big's your company? And we're like, I know it's just us. I'm like, oh, we just assume with the shirts that, that you must be some big company. You guys look really, you you present as a big company. So I thought that was pretty amusing. Yeah. And while publishers loving us certainly helps us get more content to review for you, our listeners, yeah. it's those listeners, fans, followers, and all the lobbyists who are why we do this show. Now, in addition to this, I did run into a number of fans whose feedback ranged from love for your videos, which I was surprised because our YouTube doesn't quite do as well as the rest of our stuff. Uh, never miss an episode. And my favorite so far was someone running by going, are you Mo? You saved me so much money. Seriously. Thank you. So tabletop deal fans count as well as it's all part of the tabletop bellhops services. Overall, the entire experience was uh, very affirming. And it was awesome to hear from people who appreciate both what we do and how we chose to do it. And honestly, this just energized me and got me hyped about the show and what's coming in the future. While we simply can't afford the time and money yet to go to all the cons and meet all the people we would like to, hopefully this return to attending cons after a long absence will be a step in the right direction. Yes, we had publishers begging us to go to Gen Con. And while that's probably not going to happen this year, there's a a little tiny chance, but unlikely, maybe next year we can get out and see even more of you. So thank you, everyone who took the time to talk to us while we were at the con. That kind of feedback is what fuels us to keep going. One quick announcement before we dive deeper into our Origins 2023 experience. We wanted to give you a heads up that we will not be recording on July 12th. Yeah, July 12th is day two of Amazon Prime Day, and Deanna and I are going to be very, very busy. Uh, Prime time, prime day time, whatever you want to call it, is the second busiest time of the year for us for affiliate sales through tabletop gaming deals. And I don't even want to try to fit a podcast recording right on an actual prime day. So instead of joining us live, 
Watch the various tabletop gaming deals accounts for some great deals on games. Tabletop underscore deals on Twitter, tabletop gaming deals, one word on dice.camp and the good geek deals Facebook group. We're here to answer your game gaming night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question is, so how was Origins 2023? Which we've already been asked by a number of people since the convention ended at 4 p.m. on Sunday. So that's right. Tonight's Ask the Bellhop segment is going to be a con recap with that con being the Origins Game Fair, which is held annually in downtown Columbus, Ohio. For those that don't know, Origins is an annual tabletop gaming convention put on by Gamma, the Game Manufacturers Association. Now, full disclosure, as of this year, the Tabletop Bellhop, as a brand, is a Gamma member under their new media and events arm. So Gamma has definitely stretched beyond game manufacturing and kind of encompasses all of gaming, from publishers to retailers to manufacturers, and now media as well. So we are now a part of that. We do pay for a membership for that. And that membership did cover two of our badges for Origins. So full disclosure there, I don't think it's going to impact anything we have to say. But just so you were aware of that existing relationship. Now, Origins itself is literally as old as I am, with the first con happening in 1975. And for many years, it was the second largest game convention in North America, second only to the big boy of Gen Con. Now, similar to Gen Con, this is an open to anyone gaming convention, not a trade show. Right. This convention is all about trying and buying new games. While some publishers may accept game pitches, there are always many geeky things going on. The focus is tabletop gaming of all sorts. Yeah, this is a gamers game con. This is a place to go and learn about games. Now for us, this is a game convention for both trying out new games, doing demos and playthroughs, figuring out what we want to cover and what goes on our wish list for the next year, as well as meeting with publishers and building on existing relationships or creating new ones. And wow, did that work out well this year. We came home with an impressive pile of business cards in addition to a rather large pile of games. Now, for more in information on Origins, head to OriginsGameFair.com. And for more info on Gamma, head over to Gamma, G-A-M-A, dot org. So now that you know a bit more about the con, if you hadn't heard of it, let's get into our experiences at Origins 2023. Now, this is the first Origins Deanna and I have attended since 2019 and Sean's first Origins ever. Everyone has to start somewhere. And I have to say, this was a good one, as with conventions still trying to regrow after all the shutdowns, it wasn't as crowded as it could have been, which yes. could have put me off. See, it just never quite gets that crowded. That's one of the things I've always liked about Origins. So we're going to start off with day zero or day negative one, because we did decide to head to Columbus early so that we are fresh and ready to go on Wednesday. This way, we don't have to worry about driving in before things open or when or have, we're wide awake. We don't have to worry about any weather or anything that delays us. And we get there, get up the next day, Wednesday, ready to go and ready to be con goers. So we left from Windsor. It wasn't a bad drive at all. Um, under four hours total. It wasn't, um, wasn't too hot and the roads were reasonably clear. So uh, yeah. it, was, it was a straight drive. Yeah, no accidents. And like the construction over there was ever present, but didn't not a lot of slowdowns from it. Now, where one change from previous cons we went to, we did stay at the Hilton, which is the old Hilton Tower that was always across from the convention center. Because now the Hilton's expanded and taken over part of the convention center. And they now have two towers, a uh, super easy check-in. It was all done through a Hilton app. Never had to talk to anyone. Rooms were really nice. Uh, Deanna and I got a bit of a suite where there was like a front room because we thought we might do some gaming up there, but it was a great place to store all our stuff with the bedroom being separate. I uh, love the shower, man. I wish my shower home had that kind of pressure. It was awesome because anytime we stopped in the room, I just like jumped in there for five minutes and out and kind of rinsed myself off. Uh, the only thing I would complain about is not enough coffee in the room. Like they give you, it wasn't a curry. It was some kind of Cuisinart thing, but they give you two coffees. I'm like, I'm there for six days. What am I supposed to do with two coffees? Unfortunately, I find that that is the standard hotel wide. They give you a day's worth of coffee. The coffee maker could make two cups of coffee at once. So two cut two little packages was a, a day's worth of coffee essentially to them. And then they expect to refill it every day because they technically want to get their 
cleaning staff in there on a daily basis to except this place didn't there was a big sign that says we do not do daily cleanings anymore it's only on demand due to COVID. yeah i know so but they, it's like they, they one thing adapted and the other didn't yeah unfortunately they they the the coffee world has not adapted to COVID at all but yes. i have to say uh a little message down to the to the front desk again through the app you didn't have to talk to real people uh they did hang a nice laundry bag full of coffee on my door the next day so they were responsive when coffee uh, when coffee was requested. I'm amused by Danielle's comment in the chat room. The nicer the hotel, the less coffee you get. It's maybe true. that's the problem. We, uh, the, we the nicest it. the nicest hotel I have ever stayed at. You got no coffee, no coffee maker in the room, and wow. you had to order a fifteen dollar jug of coffee if you wanted coffee wow. in your room. See, that yes. was the other thing we discovered the one night. No room service. You could not get food to your room. Yeah. Whatsoever. There's no room service at all, which I, again, I assume is a, a COVID side effect. And interestingly, if you decided to order through Skip or DoorDash or whatever, there was a designated meeting space in the lobby. They wouldn't, they weren't allowed yeah. up to your room. Yeah. So that was a little interesting. Um, so checked in, you know, got everything set up. I hit Bear Burger for dinner. We hit Bear Burger every origin since I think the first one we went to. Strongly recommend this place. I'm glad they made it through COVID. Like some of the restaurants locally didn't. Um, Bear Burger is one of these, you know, GMO free home, whatever. It's a good burger place. It, it's it's a little bit pretentious, but good burgers. Yeah, no, absolutely. They have a great menu. My only complaint is that they require you to scan the QR code on the table to get their beer menu. Although apparently that's going to change. They are they are apparently printing beer menus. Uh, yeah. They told me in the review because I completed but, it in the review. It, Sean does not like scanning QR code. I don't mind myself. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't mind the option of scanning QR codes. But if I ask for a beer menu for some reason, there should be one available. The, the See, only I just, option. I, my <laughs> thing is at least if I scan a QR code, it's probably accurate. Instead of they hand me a piece of paper and go six of these are sold out. After that, we're like, I'm, we're here. What are we going to do? And one of the things I did regret, which is weird, is I never regretted this before. I wish I had brought a game. <laughs> like something, whatever the game, something we could have played. Um, so one of my goals once we got to the first day was to pick up some small card games to play. So we at least had something. Um, we wandered around a bit. We went to the big bar on two, um, had a drink there and the big bar on two, same as it always was. Um, it is the focal like meeting point, especially if you have the people who are like need some some uh, lubricating to get comfortable around people. But oh, my God, the prices. My God, this like we went up and got like two beers. And and it was like 40 bucks. We're like, what the heck? So it was like $13 a beer. Then they add the Ohio sales tax. And then they auto add a 20% tip, which we didn't realize. So we then tipped. And and like for, and it wasn't good beer. It was, you know, it would be, if you were Canadian, it's the equivalent of like Bud and Molson and Labatt. Like, it's not like they had some awesome craft beers. So the first time ever for us going to Origins, we spent very little time on the big bar on two. We did spend that night there and like like that afternoon, that evening, ran into a couple people like Fletch from the op, who who has become a close friend of ours, it seems nowadays. Uh, that's the designer of Disney Sorcerer's Arena, ran into them, ran into one of the executive board of Gamma, who's in charge of the media events and saw a couple people. But uh, we did not, unlike any other trip or usually like Big Bar and Two's where I finished every night out just to meet people and have a couple drinks. But at that price, no. Yeah, it was ridiculous. And and what was rather somewhat underhanded was the 20% gratuity added wasn't labeled. It was no. just a 20% fee tacked on with no tag as it to didn't why. even have a line. Yeah. It just had a total. Yeah. And so people, I didn't realize that people were sharing pictures on Instagram and I saw it and I was like, seriously? And then we looked at what we paid and we're like, yeah, okay. Yeah, that was uh, like, I, like, I don't mind. I had a 20% tip, but tell me. You're adding a 20 or if when i go to tip say oh it's already included like i get the greediness of oh you're still giving me money but it, it felt underhanded yeah that was it we slept got up early relatively early um nice part about wednesday is like there, we didn't have anything important to do right like that which was the nice part of wednesday was uh, the first day of the con and for anyone who goes to origins wednesdays is like like it's it's a meet your friends play games, get to see who's there. The exhibit hall does not exist. It is also the day you want to go get your badge before having to do it once more people come in on Thursday and the weekend. So that is the first thing we did is we we went and got badges in the longest line I have ever seen for any Origins I've ever attended. 
Um, from what I understand, they're having some computer problems. When we went up, at least two of the badge generating label makers were down. Um, there was a, a confusion over media. So we're standing in this massive line and they're like, VIGs and media, put your hands up and they pull you out of the line. I'm like, oh, we're media. We're game of media. They're like, okay, so you have to go over to this other booth. So we go over to this other booth where there's a nice short line. We get up and they hand us a little red ribbon. I don't have my badge in front of me. It's over there. Red they, ribbon. They, the ribbon. Yeah, red yeah. ribbon. They hand you a little red ribbon. And then I'm like, okay, and our badges? They're like, no, no, you got to go in line for your badges. So we were able to get our, I, I don't, what's the difference between a badge and a, what do you call those? Ribbon. Scripts? It's ribbon. Hmm? It's ribbons. Ribbon. So, yeah. so we got our media ribbon, but not our badges and had to go back in the line. Thankfully, it hadn't grown much. And we pretty much got in kind of at the same spot we were on. Yeah, unfortunately, the volunteers who were being who were trying to be very helpful uh, and had been informed that VIGs and exhibitors were to go to a different place in the line. Um, they were also they understood that something happened with media and yeah. they were correct. It just wasn't the badge. Yes, uh, and we, were, so we would have had to go after the volunteers were helpful, first. but not quite helpful enough. They were they were informed just enough to be dangerous. Yes. And unfortunately, Gamma didn't tell us anything about where to get that red badge either. So I'm kind of glad we got told because otherwise we might not have got it at all. Absolutely. We would not have had, had that ribbon at all if, if we hadn't. If we, if, if we, we hadn't, we hadn't made that out. Mistake, So I guess probably. it was fortuitous. Um, now, our line wasn't, was, it, it moved. It wasn't horrible. Now, what we heard and we didn't experience this is about two hours after we did it, the system went down completely and we totally missed it. Plus, we were not VIGs, but I guess there was a lot of issues with the vig passes and what people were supposed to get when yeah unfortunately the computers like i said like mo said there were two of them down when we got there but it was still moving pretty smoothly i mean we didn't really stop and wait it was a longer line but we were going through uh whereas uh later in the day more and more computers kept shutting down and the mm -hmm. line became you know longer and apparently it was about four times the length of our line, which we felt <laughs> bordering on unreasonable, uh, yeah. became completely unreasonable later in the day based on the pictures we were seeing on uh, on Twitter and Instagram because they couldn't keep the computers up and running for whatever reason. And I, and we don't know any of the details on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, <laughs> IT at conventions is hard <laughs> on the uh, best of times, uh, but uh, that was unfortunate. I was a little confused too, because what they did is instead of picking up your goods, like your stuff, you had to go get your badge from the printers and then go get in another line to get your stuff. It just seemed odd to me. Like, why not do it at once? I don't see how that was any faster. Well, I think they were trying to get people out of the badge line as fast as possible and keep the badges moving. Although that may have been a failure because it could have been the speed that was knocking things down. Right. Knows? Yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, then we stopped and got our stuff. Um, interestingly, no book for events at all this year, which I missed that. So it used to be you would get like a telephone book, like like I'm not joking, like a telephone book thickness book of everything going on. That was all online this year. Yeah, and all I there was was this this book here, which is a tiny little pamphlet. It's an advertisement. It, it had it was it was mostly ads, and they had some featured events that Gamma decided were uh, worthy of note, uh, as well as the sponsors and uh, featured guests being yeah. listed. But it didn't have anything like a listing no. of the 5,000 games yes. taking place at the uh, event. So all you actually had was tabletop events. And anyone who's gone to a con that used tabletop events probably realizes how bad the search is. What I hated is there was no way to look at a time slot. I couldn't look at from 2 to 6 p.m. Thursday night to see what's going on. Instead, I could look at 2 and see what started at two. I could look at two thirty and see what started. And I could look at three and see what started. And I could look at three thirty and see what started. And that was just so unwieldy. I just didn't bother. So to be fair, I didn't do any scheduled events this origin, which is unusual. Usually, I try to play a couple RPGs or I schedule a full Deanna like to enter tournaments. But because of the lack of organization of that, we just skipped all that and just winged it for the whole weekend. Yeah, we had enough th other things going on. Uh, I did manage. I did actually book some uh, some sort of conferences, panels, and things throughout. Mostly that were from the 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 book con book um, yeah. featured event type things that I wanted to cover. Just sort of doing our media due diligence for the event in general, other than uh, our own needs at the event. But yep. uh, gaming wise, nope, didn't happen. Yeah, and and it might have. 
Like, like that, that was one of the bigger downfalls. So we also got our coupon book. Um, this year I didn't take advantage of it as much, but one of the things we always do is try to hit Barley's to get the pint glass. So Barley's is still there for anyone who's been there before. Barley's is an origin staple. I don't think you can go to origins without eating at Barley's at least once or at least grabbing a drink there. Um, bar in the middle, huge place, fits lots of people. They do a themed menu every year. Um, interestingly, Wizard of the Coast was not there. So usually it's a D&D themed menu. This time it was done by Arcane Wonders, a board game company. So that was cool. They had a featured beer based on their new game. The game is behind me over there. Um, tried the beer. I can't even remember what the game was now. Dubious. Thank you. Dubious. And they had a dubious Kolsch, which was decent. Um, Barley's is good. Um, I'm glad again to see that Barley's is still there. What I liked is they had last year's pint glass. So there's a sign of how small Origins last year in the middle of all the covid mess was. Barley's did not sell out of pint glasses. But they had those there, and they actually let us use our coupons because there were three of us to lose one of the coupons for the old pint glass. So we got bonus pint glass. That was cool. Yeah, no, and uh, my first time at uh, there, it was uh, good food, good drink, and the the server we had the first night was fantastic. Oh, yeah. uh, I wish we'd had her the second time we went there. <laughs> yeah, there was that. So that's it. That was, um, oh, no, no, wait, sorry. I'm jumping ahead. Yeah, yeah, no. We, I'm we, way ahead. There I, was I saw more, Wednesday, there and it threw me off. Day. This is still Wednesday. Yep. Still Wednesday. So the other thing that was happening Wednesday was something new to us. And I think this happens every year. This was the Gamma Trade Day. So this was our first time taking part. This is exclusive for Gamma members. Um, originally designed for retailers. But this year they allowed any Gamma member to attend. So we ended up attending. The, it's a full day full of panels. And then a full day of press releases from publishers. If we were retailers, we would have had to attend at least six press releases to get like your swag bag to bring home to your store. We weren't retailers, though, so we just stuck to panels that look cool to us. Um, the first one we did was game demos when, why and how presented by D. Connell, uh, who is a Canadian FLGS owner. And this was interesting, but not as applicable as I'd hoped. I was hoping to get tips for introducing a game quickly at a public play event or to kind of do elevator pitches. And this was much more, what kind of games can you sell quickly in your store with high turnover that get people in the store excited and was very much about five minute party games. Yeah, this is, this was, this was what kind of, de uh, of quick demos can you do that will uh, engender sales rapidly? Uh, what yeah. game can you, can you d demo right in front of the cash register? Uh, and, and she literally, got to the point where you know hobby games you can't really demo this way so yeah. those are a different thing we don't talk about that and that was unfortunate yeah the only thing that made me want to do and i still might do it for next year is it made me want to host a panel and and do my own presentation on demos for hobby board games because <laughs> we got to see lots of those at the con it, it just seemed odd for origins like i i understand the same the same presentation was given at the gamma trade show which is a trade show for retailers and i'm sure it made perfect sense to them well, but and again, there, there were different gamma. Yeah, there were there were different is. trains of uh, of panels, and there yeah. was a retailer thread of panels, and there were uh, publisher threads of panels, and mm -hmm. uh, later on in the week there were off there were th panels for authors and things like that. And I think right. this turned out to be a retailer panel that could have been a little better described. I think yeah. is, is really what it was. Yeah, that's probably the best way to put it. Um, the other panel we attended as part of Gamma Trade Day was Potential of Play, Bonus Benefits of Board Games. Now, this was put on by the Bodana Group, and the the representative was Jack Birkenstock Jr., who I've got to say is one of the better presenters I've ever sat in on. Like, he was just enjoyable to listen to. This was a fascinating panel. This was all about using gaming uh, to heal to to deal with mental issues and in particular he is someone who does rehabilitation of crimes uh victims and people perpetrating crimes including abuse so super heavy topic where he talked about using various different styles of board games and games to reach out to people and to help them heal uh, absolutely fascinating topic yeah, this was this was wonderful. Uh, they go to uh, many different events and they run many different events and things, uh, both private and public. Uh, they talked in in detail and one uh, interestingly about uh, events for autistic and spectrum uh, children's where they have counselors there on site in case someone has 
issues and needs mm-hmm. to be attended to, uh, but also just in order to help, you know, minimize the uh, events happening by engaging in board games. Uh, yeah. It was really interesting, and it's something I think we would love to even consider taking uh, taking advantage of and using if we can get some of that knowledge up across the border yes. into Canada. They are a U.S. based group, uh, and they're still somewhat local, but uh, they definitely have interest in growing. And uh, I would love to see us help facilitate that because yeah. of the good that they're doing. Yeah, we we basically attended hoping to get some information on being able to run more accessible events. Here in Windsor, so that we could have an artistic game night, for example. No, one of his things were don't call it the artistic game night, but you know what I mean as a podcast listener that that's what we would want to do. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, not available in Canada right now. But they do do training courses, so this is something we're going to look into more. Perhaps I can take an online course or something to at least be able to better facilitate local gaming events. So that one was well worth it. That w- that was an enjoyable panel in all ways. So next up, there at the end of the day. There was a wrap-up event, or two wrap-up events, uh, for different portions of the Gamma uh, groupings. Uh, And for media, they set up a first look, a chance for publishers to present new and upcoming games to us, the media. Yeah. So this was uh, supposed to be 40 different games, but I didn't count. It didn't feel like it was 40. But the, the list of who was going to be there were 40. Um, we did some nice pre-planning where we were going to hit booths in order, but unfortunately they let people grab tables wherever. But anyway, I don't want to complain about the event too much. I just want to talk about some of the awesome stuff we saw. Uh, so first up, I sat down and got an overview of Marrakesh Essential Edition from Queen Games. So what happened with Marrakesh? Marrakesh is a very expensive, it's the latest Stefan Feld game. It uses a cube tower, totally up my alley, 100%, but a $140 US retail. They decided to put out an essential edition that is under 80, that is more in the average buy it at your local game store game price for the average person to buy. And yes, I know it's sad that the average game is about 80 bucks now. So this features the exact same game, but all lesser components. And I got to say, it still looked really good. Yeah, this did not seem like a cheap game. This seemed like a, a fantastic game. Uh, which makes me wonder who, who, someone who hasn't seen the, the original Marrakesh. Good Lord, how much more was there? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, we'll find out. Uh, that's that's right there above me is the original Marrakesh. So we did we did bring a copy of that home, but not from this event. Um, next, we stopped by Smirk and Dagger. Uh, Kurt Colbert is an amazing person with an awesome personality. I, I, one of the most enthusiastic people in the board game hobby. Um, I think now that Stephen Bonacore is retired, he's now replaced Stephen as the most energetic man in board gaming. Um, They were showing off a number of different things, including Boop, and just announced to us then was Boop. Boop is an awesome game about cats bouncing on a bed. Well, Boop is the new Halloween-themed version with a ghost cat. Uh, They also showed off this, like, neat narrative RPG game, which unfortunately I didn't note the name down of. We weren't, that that was just a preview or a a prototype, so we we didn't really take a lot of time looking at it, but Kurt covered that. Yeah, the, then when the, I have to say, Boop, mati- like Boop, is one of those table present game, table present oh, games. Yeah. Um, it looks, you know, you will see that on the table and run over and go, "Oh my gosh, that's so cute!" Yes, yes. Next was Apothecary from One First Games. This is a, a deck building game about combining ingredients. Fantastic artwork. Didn't get a full overview of play. Uh, we checked out Oris from AESC Games, which looked amazing. Uh, more about that one later, because that looked good enough. We followed up. Uh, the latest cooperative root building game. Sorry, cooperative pickup and deliver game. Um, they're claiming it's the first, and so far I think they're right. I haven't seen it yet. It's a game called Express Route Root or Route from the Op. Like a cooperative pickup and deliver game. It looked interesting, but for the op, it was very I don't know. It looked bland. It it, it really didn't pop. Um, kind of reminded me of um some of the, oh, what's the the Pan Am game? Like it just kind of I don't know. It, it it didn't look like an op game to me. Uh, that is not out. So like this is all we just got. Kind of a first look at it. Um, Hollow Type from Brex Works, which looked awesome. Uh, Crustaceous Rails. Okay, Crustaceous Rails is a train game where you are going back in time 
collecting dinosaur DNA by building railroads. This is from a new um, publisher called Spielcraft, um, published by by uh, um, Spielcraft with two awesome, very flamboyant designers. Uh, the, the, it was only a prototype, but like lots of plastic dinosaurs that could ruin your train routes. Like, like just fascinating me because it was a heavy, and I don't think it was 18xx level, but heavy train game with dinosaurs. Yep. Yeah, that's the the and dinosaurs was in, was was a, yes. a, a still a major theme this. Uh, oh yes, this, definitely this, uh, that year. <laughs> we liked your show just outside the bathroom. My brother and I said hi, and that we liked your show just um, outside. Yeah, the so bathroom. there was a, again a bunch of stuff while Mo was doing some uh, talking with with games. I went over and stopped off at uh, Mobius Games. Uh, while Mo is doing some demos, Mobius is the publisher of Prowlers and Paragons, uh, specifically the Ultimate Edition, most recently. Yep. Uh, because, well, I saw a superhero RPG, and you're not going to stop me. So I went over and I had a little chat with them. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't bring home any content from them, but uh, I did learn about a uh, new book that I had missed on Kickstarter. So there you go. Yeah. Did you get a business card from them? Because that's did, someone yeah. we might be able to reach out. Yeah, yeah. we might reach out later. We got to get some RPGs played and then we might reach out to some more other people. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the games I was hyped to check out is Robot Quest Arena. This is from Wise Wizard. Wise Wizard finally doing a board game and not a card game, though there were cards involved. This is a really fascinating looking robot battle game that just looked amazing. It has some of the best player pieces I've ever seen. The robots look like um, they look like Amiibos like or or or. Uh, what is it, Spyro or whatever, you know, all those games where you put the plastic piece on the, the video games where you put the plastic piece on the thing and your character shows yeah, up. They, in the they're game. sizable. They're not minis. Yeah, like, like you don't, you, they're not little minis. They're, they're chunky, uh, chunky, plastic. full color plastic. I was so hyped about this one, but unfortunately, it's just in prototype stage and won't be out till Gen Con. Was excited about that. It looks really good. I, I, I'm looking forward to that. That's now on my wish list. Um, we checked out some high end gaming bling from Luxury Play Style which I've got to say the nicest looking tokens for your games, but way out of my budget. Um, like, like, like gamer bling for like uh, real bling, like gold magic life counters and stuff like really over the top. I'm possibly going to look work with them in the future. If we can find a game I own that they publish pieces for, like they have X wing and stuff. They, they, their big one right now that is absolutely amazing looking is elder sign, which is the Yahtzee like dice game from fantasy flight. I don't, I'm not a fan of Elder Sign. Uh, most of the games that they were publishing upgrades for, I don't play. If I was a Magic player, I would have been all over it. But man, beautiful. Like, like honestly, the best looking, like, upgraded components, metal pieces that I've seen. Yeah, they did really amazing work. Uh, we did discuss with them, actually, at one point about uh, about tactile uh, designs. Yes. Uh, and specifically, your name came up, Ryan. Uh, because one of the things they don't do is differentiate specifically by feel for some of their uh yeah. things they do a lot of color work so they'll they'll basically you know hammer out a a number of uh pieces and use a uh, acrylic paints or uh, other forms of mm -hmm. paints to differentiate between styles yeah uh, they so had a number of lotuses for legend of the five rings that were great looking but every lotus was identical painted different and i was suggesting they had different numbers of leaves on the lotus or or go with different flowers that also fit the theme uh, another big one, we got to see CGE and got to see CGE's latest game, which everyone's going to hate because you're not going to be able to pronounce it and spell it, but it's Kunta Hora, the City of Silver, that just looked really good. This is still at prototype stage. You had a fog of war, exploring things, look very different from CGE's normal games. Um, interestingly, not the same components because CGE's always been known for the same kind of plastic dicks and little robot ships and stuff, or little rocket ships and stuff. This this is a divergence for them. It looks like they're going in a new direction. And they did have the latest Arnak expansion. So for Arnak fans, we got to see the latest expansion, which just adds two new leaders, a ton of different maps. And if I remember correctly, there was a campaign mode. Indeed. So we have uh, a, a story-based Arnak. And it is compatible with previous, but not requiring previous expansions yes. to Arnak. So I gotta say overall, that media first look made me glad we got a gamma membership. Like like just getting that first look. Um, I'll be able to share some pictures online of stuff people may not be able to see otherwise, but just to know what to get excited about. 
But honestly, what was better for this is it was a quiet place one-on-one to get to meet publishers or publishers representatives or designers of the games. You're not in a crowded hall where people are behind you waiting to do a demo. It was a great way to meet up with people and go, you know, I want to do a demo of this. Can we set up a time to meet later during the con? And it worked out really well because a whole bunch of the people we met that night, we then met with later and got more involved with. Now, on the slightly negative side, it wasn't all perfect. Uh, They they had uh, changed venues uh, Mm -hmm. for some reason rather last minute. And so some of the publishers were caught off guard uh, and what that ended up being uh, resulting in was the publishers didn't necessarily have the space they'd expected or the time to set up they'd expected. So there was a little bit of awkwardness in some points where there were two different publishers sharing one table. And mm-hmm. that can be awkward, especially if as media, you are very interested in one game and not necessarily interested yeah. in the other game. Uh, there's there's You don't want to snub the person, but at the same time, you know, we don't cover this sort of product so we are going to move to another table but it feels rude to do yes. so yeah yeah i the, the i felt bad passing by people at that event i don't feel bad passing by a booth on a con floor right. but that was much more personal and it did feel like we're like oh i don't want that yeah game. you spend five minutes talking to someone at one half of the table and you turn around and go oh sorry that's not for me but that, that yeah. just feels weird no i agree so from there we tried to go to a pizza party that it ends up we weren't invited to uh, due to some miscommunication from Gamma, um, it was part of Gamma Trade Day, and I thought as Gamma members, we were invited to take part in all of Trade Day. But it ends up that they had a retailer track and a, a media track, and while the two overlapped a bunch, like the pres- the um, panels we went to, well, I shouldn't say panels, presentations we went to, uh, this was not an overlap. So I got to say the Gamma's communication could have been better. That That was definitely something that could have been better. Yeah, Gamma is historically just for publishers and retailers. And now with these other member types, they are trying to develop a new way of doing things. And I I don't envy them. That's a difficult thing to break away from uh, a path you've been on for 46 years. Yes. uh, and, And suddenly add a whole new section to the way you've been doing things. Yeah, we definitely met Gamma members that weren't even aware there was a media and events membership voting member. We are voting members of Gamma. Like, we are legit members. We pay to be part of that. And there were people who thought we were pulling their leg and making up the fact that that even existed. But you know what? It wasn't that bad. And to be fair, the convention center pizza didn't look very good. So instead, we wandered the gaming hall. So one of the things I do want to point out, because even I missed it and Sean missed it, Deanna had it, but um, most people don't realize that the gaming hall, the big open gaming area, and some vendors, including Queen, Japanime Games, um, Corvus Belly Miniatures, are open on Wednesday. So the exhibit hall is not open, but the gaming hall is. So that's worth noting. If you're not aware of that, like Wednesday, you can start gaming. So we wandered around. Um, We saw some fantastic miniature games tables that were set up, um, mainly for like the rest of the event, some fantastic scenery. Um, In particular, I I could not figure out who they were from, but Corvus Belly's Infinity is a a miniature game with a very cyberpunk look that to me reminds me of Appleseed. And they had this MDF laser cut scenery that is some of the best I've ever seen including um, acrylic signs and stuff that look like neon. That, that was absolutely amazing. So, like, look through my pictures from Origins. I just love that. I'm like, man, I want a set of that, and I have no reason to use it. Yeah, as well, there were uh, some classics there. The Smurf game, which people uh, who, who go to Origins are aware of. There was the airship game, which is a three-dimensional hanging uh, swinging uh, ship, ships of the air game. There is, was a uh, a battle tank flight game that takes up a large chunk of the floor it was actually like a 10 by 30 foot booth where the floor was the actual map and people were walking around with tanks and and things uh really uh, fantastic and then the entire back quarter of the uh entire of of hall c was the gaming library which wasn't while not as big as previous was still a sizable library and a fantastic uh area to play with uh, nice game topper mats on all of the tables to protect your games and the games of the library. 
and props to the Columbus Convention Center for finally buying some new tables <laughs> because playing a game in the public play area of Origins was always taking your life into your hands that you might slice yourself open on a stray piece of wood. So that was impressive to see. And yeah, and the other thing that was a nice bonus this year is there was no charge to use the open gaming. You didn't have to buy a board game room pass or any of that. So that was pretty cool. Um, while wandering, Deanna and I did a full playthrough of Powerline from Queen Games uh, since they were set up there. This is a nice lighter game. It feels like a roll and write, but instead you're putting lots of bits on top of your board. I think this would be a good public play game. Um, it's all about making connections. You're rolling dice. It had a neat mechanic where you had a bunch of numbers on your board, right? Because it looks like a roll and write. And you have a set of rainbow dice rolled and you have to use them in either left to right or right to left. And that was brilliant. So like if I had five, six, four, I would have to use my five, then my six, then my four. But at the other end, it could be three, two, one. And I, I could start with three, two, one. Instead of five, six, four, one, two, three, I could go three, two, one, four, five, six. I think I did that right. I think I actually nailed that. Um, and that was just a neat mechanic. And there was a way you could skip a die. And then there was a way you could use these sun tokens. Um, they noted it's a very green game. This is their attempt to produce like a more environmentally friendly game. It fits the theme of solar power, which is what this game's about. I dig it. It was neat, but it wasn't really heavy enough for my regular group. And we already grabbed lots of great public play games for our local play events that are going to get more attention than this. this. This was, I will say, fiddly, because instead of rolling right where you're marking it off, you're having to put meeples on your board and then replacing them with power line tokens. Yeah. Now, one of the other fantastic things that we got to take advantage of while we were there was a distributor of crokinole boards had set up a tournament area where yeah. at the time on Wednesday were just open for free play mm -hmm. uh, with some absolutely stunning oh, yeah. product. Um, and I did, we didn't write down the name of yes, the, I did. Oh, Brown did. Castle games, Brown Castle games. Yes, this yeah. definitely worth. Uh, they do actually have both Canadian and U S suppliers for their products, uh, and they do custom as well as uh, their own designs for your crokinole boards, uh, even to the point where when you order a board, uh, even if you're ordering one of their uh, their boards and not a custom board, the center, the, the, the drop-in portion, you can get a custom uh, disc uh, with a graphic on it of your design to fit in there to, uh, to brand your board um, as well as all just the discs and, and all the fancy things. Yeah, and they, they also had some nice like wooden accessories, like a score tracker that fits a standard size puck. I don't even know if they're called pucks. This shows I am horrible Ontario one, right? <laughs> Never play Crokinole. Well, I fixed that. Deanna and I sat down and we played against each other. And I learned the most vital rule in Crokinole I never understood about the game that really makes the game. And that is you sit at the table you don't get to walk around every flicking game I have. You can flick at any angle. When you play Crokinole, you have to fire from within one arc and that's it. You can't shoot anywhere else. And man, does that really change things compared to every other flicking game I've ever played? Like every other one I play, I want to put on a lazy Susan so you can flick <laughs> it around. So I get it. Um, these boards were were unbelievable. Like the, the smoothness that the the discs slid like a. Uh, like there was some rosin and, and on the edges, they'd obviously dusted them down or whatever, but like just unbelievable. Um, I, I now feel like I'm a better Ontario in that I have now at least played Crokinole once. And that just leave me wanting one. Now, I will say the Brown Castle games boards were amazing looking, but they were quite out of our price range. And and uh, Eggman Jr. correctly says they are just called discs. That's discs. actually what okay. they're, they're called, discs. Uh, next, we wander to the back. I don't know. This might actually happen before Crokinole. I don't quite remember. It's a bit of a blur. Uh, we did meet up with Kevin from Game Toppers, who would uh, rival play for, again, people with the most exuberance and energy in gaming. Uh, game Toppers is a fantastic company. They started off just making Game Toppers, then went on to making Neoprene Mats, and now published board games as well. Um, checked out a few of his tables. They're, they're great. Like I, Honestly, they really are. The neoprene mats he's now making that were amazing with stitched edges, like double sided. And it was funny because he had these boards set up and each one had about eight neoprene mats under them. And he would just fold them up to show it to you. Um, we talked to them quite a bit about future collaborations, and I'm really hoping we can work with them in the future. Uh, they may be our next official sponsor for the podcast, which will be cool. 
What I'm hoping to get out of them is an eight by four mat for my personal gaming table to cover my big boardroom table downstairs. What's interesting is uh, previously the concept of an eight by four anything from Game Toppers would have been foreign, but yeah. they have recently redesigned their uh, their framing system, the, the, the topper system. Uh, so instead of 36 inch uh, sections, they are now 24 inch sections which allow a more a wider flexibility mm -hmm. of game topper configurations to be made. And so now they go all the way up to the eight by four size yep. and have the mats to go with. And that was a fantastic thing to learn while we were there. Yeah, that was a good one. And I got to say, I'd strongly recommend their stuff. I, I tried to push him. I'm like, yeah, I see the secret cabal's got one with a big logo in the middle. You can do a big bell hop. And he's like, yeah, we'll see. We're, we're not quite big enough for that one, but that's fair. We'll help them out. We'll, we'll do some advertising, show them what we can do, and then maybe it'll be better next year. Absolutely. Uh, that was pretty much it for the end of day one. Uh, we wandered up North High to find somewhere to eat and discovered the, it, it's called Local Cantina. By saying the Local Cantina, it's the name of a chain it ends up. Um, this was a a great Mexican place, like like cheapest beer we had all weekend, which was nice. All you can eat, serve yourself chips with fantastic salsa. Um, some decent tacos, just a great vibe. It was very comfortable. Um, the waiter was fantastic. Keep coming back to the table. Uh, this was a new to us place. This isn't somewhere I'd discovered in the past. Maybe it's new since 2019. I don't know, but definitely somewhere I'll go back to. Absolutely. I had a fantastic quesadilla there. It was the, the Buffalo, Buffalo cheese, mac and cheese quesadilla thing that was sounded ungodly, but was fantastically delicious. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was, you know, good drinks, good service good uh, friendly environment yep so that's it for day one of origins so day two origins day two thursday <laughs> uh so one of the benefits we get as media is early access to the gaming hall so we took advantage of that and got in there right at nine an hour before they're supposed to open which this year wasn't bad um usually i find you get in an hour early and it just means everyone's not set up yet and you bother them as they're trying to set up. That wasn't as much the case. Um, what we did this year that's different from previous years is usually I just try to go up and down the hall, starting at aisle 100 and moving my way over to aisle 2,800 or whatever they get to, and just going up and down. Well, this time I went, you know what? We have this media pass. People know we're in here as media um, or a VIG. It could have been one or the other. And again, we'll get to talk to people more personally without a crowd around. So instead, what we did is... We hit up the front. So the way Origins is organized is the big publishers get big booths that are up at the front. And the smaller you are, the further back you are. And I have to assume there's a cost difference. The, the booths at the back don't cost as much as the booths up the front. Um, amusingly, with a bunch of big publishers not going to Origins this year, we ran into a lot of people that were very happy with their booth positioning this year because they got to be a lot closer to the doors. So this is what we did was we went for the big publishers. We went for the big names. Now, these were a mix of ones we've worked with in the past, as well as some new companies that we are reaching out to for the first time. So first booth we hit was the op. Uh, we took a look at, um, we hit up the op, which was nice. I hung out with them for a little bit, but I had a meeting with them. So we just kind of skipped by. We got a first look at Kapow, which is a two-player supers dice battler from White Wizard. Um, we went by the dice unicorn from Foam Brain. This is always a big thing. We didn't do it. But as you get a cup of dice, you get a plastic cup and scoop up as much dice as you can from this inflatable unicorn. We went to the ridiculously huge Studio 2 booth. Um, they are the publisher of Adventuria, and they actually had it in stock. So I saw Adventuria in the live, in the wilds where people <laughs> could buy it. So the Adventuria card game that every time we talk about people are like, you can't get it. Well, it was there. Uh, I'll admit we didn't see it at that time. We found it later, but it was there. Um, we stopped at Cubicle 7, where I walked away with the first review copy of the entire con. Um, that was a copy of Elector Counts. This is a Warhammer fantasy roleplay card game. And while there, we saw the most beautiful roleplaying books I've ever seen in my entire life. And that was their deluxe copy of The Enemy Within campaign. Um, despite begging about as hard as I could, we could not walk away with a copy of those. Um, technically we could have come back Sunday and possibly gotten the regular versions of the anime with them, but I don't want those. These were beautiful books. I think the retail was like $280 or something like that for the full set. 
way out of my price range, but as a Warhammer first edition fanboy and having run the majority of that campaign, I, I was tempted. Yeah, it was. I mean, it, it's really hard to understand just how gorgeous these books are. Uh, these are a collector's edition of of the books. Uh, Cubicle 7 has done a full 10 book set with yeah. slip uh slip cover slip, slip case. cases um it's just fantastic i don't even know if they list the price on them i don't, <laughs> I don't even think that's you know yeah, yeah. It, if you I, have I, to ask you can't afford it I, I don't remember the exact quote but it, it was it was it was the no i can't justify that yeah <laughs> even as review copies because we talked about it so i said they did say maybe we can do the original i'm like how long would it be before i could actually review that through the entire enemy within i know very few people who've actually completed that yeah uh swung by the van rider booth which was all about final girl um that's a solo only game not something i was interested in but packed the whole time um the capstone booth was was never empty like there were games i had hoped to demo this weekend at capstone never there was never anywhere to sit down at the capstone booth so congratulations um clay a capstone for for nailing it like i and and i gotta say like like it was full from that point until the doors closed on sunday though the amount of product it, it was pretty empty of product on sunday but there were still people there a japan anime games was showing off a ridiculous number of different games i don't think any other publisher had as many different games being demoed at once and not only were they demoing and selling in the exhibit hall they had an entire section in the play hall that mm -hmm. was just for signing up to learn to play uh, about six different Japan anime games. They were very active. This. Very active. And one of the things they were pushing that I was excited to see is Cowboy Bebop, which I still love that game. I didn't need to do a demo or anything. I, I should have went up and said, is the designer here so I can shake their hand? Didn't think of it, though. Um, next, we swung by the the uh, Strange Magic Games, Strange Machines, sorry, Strange Machine Games booth, where I ran into Dr. Wix, someone I interact with often online, and one of the designers of Robotech Reconstruction. This is the latest Robotech game, and this one is a coin-style game. They don't like it if you call it a coin game. Don't call it a coin game because GMT owns coin games, but it's a coin-style game just after the first Robotech War. So we got to meet Dr. Wix in person, which was cool. Um, one of the few smart people at the con wearing a, a mask. So good on you, Dr. Wix, especially doing demos. I'm surprised we didn't see more of that. And I guess that game looks pretty good. Um, swung by Smirk and Dagger and just went, you know what? We got, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to them later because they're packed. Um, stopped by Green Ronin and got to chat with Chris Pramis for a bit. So Or Green Ronin. Sorry, I always... My head is Green Ronin, but they pronounce Green Ronin, where I met Chris Pramis, the owner of the company, and begged him for a copy of the new Sentinels of Earth Prime superhero card game. This is a new edition of Sentinels of the Multiverse based on the second edition of Sentinels of the Multiverse, but totally been redone with all new characters, villains, and events based on the Mutants and Masterminds universe. So after enough begging, he eventually agreed to give me the demo copy at the end of the con, which you can now see behind me. Yeah, no. and now while this, uh, while Mo and D continued on through the exhibit hall, I took in a panel on that was described as marketing in a brand new world. Uh, there was supposed to be a discussion of how to market uh, for, you know, a post pandemic or continuing pandemic or, you know, post lockdown, however you would like to term it world where you know things have certainly changed some now the interesting part about this uh this panel was nobody from the panel showed up <laughs> uh we waited about 10 or 15 minutes as as a, a crowd of people in chairs and then decided well we're all here and interested about marketing we must know something so let's talk uh and continue to run our own panel on marketing uh with each different people we had artists we had publishers we had design we had game uh, game designers and uh, media and other people and art artists just talking about our experiences, what has worked for us, what hasn't worked for us, uh, software that that helps, social media sites that that work and don't work, and how different social media sites work, and literally just ran our own marketing panel. Which again, as Mo was saying with the the demoing panel, makes me think that uh, 
Deanna should be running our own panel game. Unfortunately, she oh. wasn't there, and I I kept having to, uh, to to sort of wish she was because she does the majority of our marketing and is the expert on of all of that. But thankfully, I do listen to her whenever she <laughs> she speaks to us, and I had a little bit to offer uh, as well from that side. So uh, yeah, that was uh, apparently they lost their panelists, but we made up for it anyway. So we think it may have been because the app was off by four hours. So the panelists might have showed up to give a panel four hours earlier or later. I'm not sure which way it was off. Yes. Apparently when tabletop events added their events to the app uh, that was being hosted by Origins, they forgot to allow for the GMT plus minus. And so the time schedule was off by four hours. Which was a good surprise for Sean the next morning. At this point, we took a break for lunch at Starbucks, which is right in the convention center, which ended up being our go-to brunch place for the rest of the weekend. Uh, for some reason, it just wasn't that packed. So that was kind of odd. Like the Starbucks was never all that backed up and Starbucks makes pretty good breakfast sandwiches. I'm not a huge fan of their coffee, but it's coffee. And a really odd thing about Columbus that I, I Sean didn't even believe us till we were there is you can't really get coffee except at breakfast in Columbus. And I don't know what it is. Many restaurants don't even serve it. Yeah, I've been to a lot of cities all across North America. And Columbus, while I'm sure it's not actually unique, is strange in that they don't serve coffee everywhere all the time. Um, or at least, I will say, in the Arts District, where the Convention Center and this uh, con. For all I know, if you went to downtown to the Business District, this might be different. But where we were... In the restaurants, in the convention center, in the hotels, uh, they don't serve it at all, or they don't serve it after like 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, for some reason, the idea of an evening coffee doesn't appear to uh, interest them. Uh, and it was downright bizarre because uh, myself and Dee tend to prefer, a, you know, a nice cup of coffee with dinner. There's nothing wrong with yeah. that. They disagree. It sure seems like it. For example, Bear Burger never has served coffee. Like <laughs> they just don't have it. Yeah. Uh but on the, the well on, on day one when we went to Barley's, I asked for a coffee and they said, Oh, we only have decaf. And I said, you know what? That's fine because I wasn't drinking. I mean and then she came out and she was amazed that she found one bag of coffee that she could make. And, and yes. it, that was miraculous. And and I was confused, but I accepted it and was very happy. Yes. See, we knew this going in, so we were aware of the coffee issue. Uh, other place we stopped by, we stopped by the Kess Group's booth, uh, where we checked out a modern trick taker. Um, also got a look at the latest Mega Man game that looks actually pretty solid. Uh, an interesting co-op game where every character is trying to complete their own set of three levels. I thought it was a cool way to do it. Um, the thing that seemed to be ma missing from that is the basic gameplay didn't have any way to get the boss's powers, but there was a legacy version where you could do that. That looks kind of interesting. Um, we also saw tons of vendors just selling geeky stuff. One of the things you will get at, 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 at Origins, it kind of feels like going to an art in the park, is you're going to find art. You're going to find paintings. You're going to find clothing, photography, LARP weapons, uh, costuming, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, not what we were there to look at, though. Uh, unfortunately, they did have an artist's alley, as they called it, but uh, they didn't um, they didn't sort separate of separate it, really. separate it very well. So there it, rather than an artist's alley, it just kind of you you walked in and out of artists areas and it, there was no clearly defining borders. So you kind of just had to wander around aimlessly and, and got, got frustrated at some point if you were only looking for art or if you were yeah. only looking for games uh, because of the lack of of separation yeah it was basically you'd walk down an aisle it'd be games 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 bit of art games some clothing bit of games but and then you're like oh, a little more art oh an artist oh someone's selling a book and then you're like oh and this oh i guess this is the artist at the end but then there's a booth on scenery which yeah. like someone did they consider that art i don't know well and then and then at the very end there would be like you know a puzzle like a puzzle booth or something but yeah right <laughs> like it didn't quite fit yeah. um there was a massive free league booth i i drooled over many things there um, the Forbidden Lands box set, ever since the misdirected Mark folk were talking about playing that. I don't even know how many years I'm going back now. This pre-COVID, I think. I've wanted that. And and I, I tried to sell it to Dee, and she's like, we don't play RPGs, right? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay. 
Um, and then ironically, D wandered over to a nearby booth and found something called Hexplorer magnetic map tiles, which were magnetic hexes that you would put on like a dry erase board to make your hex map. And they were awesome looking. And I kept thinking, see, if I bought Forbidden Lands, I need to buy this too, because Forbidden Lands is a giant hex crawl. I mean, you could build the map and like, I'm like, I have a nice big whiteboard like that, that I'm like, I could put that up and put the tiles. We passed, we, we tempted, but <laughs> I got to say, man, that, that looked tempting. Uh, we then swung by a booth and tried out, this was Outset Games is the name of the company. It's not one I actually recognized from before the con. So uh, congratulations on them having a presence there because they caught our eye. And we tried out a game called Zensu, specifically Deanna. Played the, I think he was the designer of the game, or at least like head of the company. He was someone important with the company, someone that could make decisions. Um, and it went really well. Like they destroyed him, and he seemed very shocked, which was pretty funny. Uh, this is a very Asian themed, kind of looks like shogi, if you know shogi with the arrow pieces. But instead, you only had two types of pieces that can move certain ways, and your goal was to get one of your pieces to the opponent's side of the board. A, a very much a chess light game kind of seemed like Onitama advanced. Now, this went so well, we're now working with Outset. So expect to see some reviews of Outset games coming forward. Um, we did get a copy of Zensu as well as Psycho Babble um, because this person was obsessed with us bringing this game home. So I think he might have been the insane person who had the dream because this was a Cthulhu themed social deduction game. It looks fantastic because it has some great artwork on these cards where the players have all shared a dream, but one of them is insane and shared a different dream than the rest of us. And you're trying to figure out who is the person who's insane. And I realize there are some problems with that theming, but the, the card art was really neat. And as long as you overlook the fact that they're using insanity as a game mechanic, I look like an OK game. I fully explained this to the, the guy and told him I hate social deduction games. And he still insisted we bring it home. So that'll be an interesting review. Yep. Then we skipped by the op earlier because I had a meeting with them, sat down. I got to play What the Cup. Um, initial impression right now, because I'll talk about this one a bit more, is I need this game. Um, this is, this is um, what do you call it? Oh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the game with the cup and the dice. I, I want to say past the ace. That's a liar's <laughs> dice. Thank you. <laughs> Liar's Dice for Gamers, um, they were awesome enough to actually hand us over an early copy of At The Ready. This is the latest expansion for Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Even the op has not shared all the cards that come in this game. Um, I think they've now released what the three characters are. Um, we have a total exclusive on this. We were handed the first copy that was given to someone who wasn't the op. So that was pretty amazing. That, that was, Thank you, the op. Um, now I cracked this open and our unboxing is live. So when you're done here, you can go over to YouTube and check out what you get in there and find out what comes in the latest expansion. So huge props to the op and Fletch for giving us that opportunity. That That's one of those makes us feel good. Um, they also gave us a sneak peek at a game called The Art Project, where it's A.R.T. Off the top of my head, I don't remember what art stands for. This was a co cooperative game with amazing Vincent Dutrade art. That has a very 70s exploitation film look to it. Uh, this looked really neat. Yeah, no, they, the op has got some really fantastic things going on. Uh, and we are super happy to be uh, both uh, <laughs> proud enough to be able to, uh, to debut some of their stuff prior to release. But also take a look at some of the things like the art project here. Uh, yeah. So... Which I would love to share more, but I don't know where my pictures I took went. I know I hit the button on my phone. I know I took pictures of the player boards and I took pictures of those like six different maps and they're gone. I don't know what happened. So I feel terrible. They gave us this early look at the art project and I don't have any pictures to share. But people are going to get excited for this now. I, mm -hmm. I think it was a Gen Con release, so you'll be seeing more from the op. Yep. Now from the op, we also took home a copy of Tapple, which seems silly. I know it's a mass market game you can get anywhere, but I've wanted a copy since John Salalila brought a copy out to local game store, Brimstone Games. And I'm like, that's brilliant. His rule was you toss out the cards and pick your own category that has to be gaming related. So, you know, we're doing meeple colors or whatever. I want a copy of that forever. So thanks to the op for handing that over. And I'm also going to get a chance to check out Marvel Dice Throne. With the option that if we dig it to check out the expansion. So I like that. Like they understood that. They're like, here, check out Dice Throne. If you like it, we'll help you out. So that was cool. 
then headed over to meet up with our friend Mark Spector, longtime fan of the show, probably our biggest advocate uh, out there. And he's uh, with Grand Gamers Guild, and he literally gave me a pile of games. I handed me a copy of every game we hadn't reviewed yet of theirs, <laughs> uh, which necessitated a trip back to the hotel room. Uh, so this includes Endangered and its expansions, the Artemis Project, the Artemis Odyssey, the expansions for that, the latest Holiday Hijinks game, and How, which is their latest Mesoamerican game. So that was impressive. Like, like, oh, man. So you're, you're going to get to hear a lot about Grand Gamers Guild games, which if they live up to the other Grand Gamers Guild games we've reviewed, I expect to be good. I am most excited about one of the Artemis games, and I'm terrible here because one of them is based on Ad Astra, which is part of the old designer series of games that I really liked. I just can't remember if it's Artemis and Odyssey. So one of those I'm, I'm looking forward to more than the other. Yeah, no, and we we really again have to have to thank uh, Mark and Grand Gamers Guild for their generosity uh, and their uh, support of this show. Uh, it's you know it's fantastic that they respect us and appreciate our feedback and opinions enough to be willing to just say here, just review our yeah, stuff go. because you know whether you like it or not, we we appreciate the the truth you tell. So it is Artemis Odyssey is the one that is the Ad Astra. And please, if you are waiting for your Kickstarter copies, please don't be jealous that we got it ahead of you. Please realize that publishers need cons like this to stay afloat. This is their big money maker. I'm sure they will get you your game. Please don't be jealous that anyone at a con was able to get a copy of a game that you haven't gotten yet. It is all part of doing business. Cons are huge for publishers. Cons are sometimes what keep them afloat. So I, I'm, I'm not saying that the person in the chat that brought that up is feeling that way. But just pointing out that it, that it is is perfectly valid for a publisher to sell a game at a con, even though their backers haven't gotten it yet. You have no choice. Uh, next, we got to see Stellaris at Academy Games. Uh, this is the board game version of the huge 4X uh, uh, video game. And man, I was blown away. Like, this looks amazing. This has one of the best, I don't even know what to call it, player consoles I've ever seen. Like, th there was this plastic thing that holds all your bits. And then you had spots to slide cards in the top and then people could see stuff from the back and it looked like a display screen from the other side and there were hexes and all kinds of wooden minis and oh my God, did it look good. And sadly, it wasn't available. So I think that was another Gen Con release. We probably could have fit a demo in, but the fact that we knew we couldn't bring a copy home, I decided not to do it. But man, that game looks good. Um, then I tried out a very cool racing game called Reality Shift which we did end up bringing home uh, later when we went by the booth a different time. I had Sean try reality shift. <laughs> Excuse me. It's a game about racing on cubes where you can rotate and twist and turn the cubes and you move magnetic ships so they can go around. Like you're going to see this one. Yeah. Fantastic. This, this, you can't describe this one adequately. You just can't. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know, know how to describe this without showing it to you. Very cool looking game. And we did bring a copy of that home along with a couple other Academy games because they were extremely excited to work with us. So we met Uwe from from Academy, who we did not work with in the past. This is one of our new connections. So one of the one of the awesome things that happened. Uh, we then because they were right next door, stopped by Wise Wizard, got to meet Debbie. Uh, people probably know Debbie, a very, very large personality in the board game, um, board game industry. Uh, we snagged copies of Kapow, which looked really cool. This is a, a dice building aspect that I didn't know was part of it. I thought it was more superhero Yahtzee, mm -hmm. where you just roll a bunch of dice, place them on your boards to either punch people or use your powers. But there's a whole mechanic where you can improve one of the dice. So that I thought was really cool. Looking forward to checking that out. Um, what they were de debuting there was volume two. So it was a full new set of heroes. And what this also adds is it'll let us play three and four player, which for the three of us, I think is perfect. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I was I was really interested in this again, being a superhero game, not a big shock there. Uh, but I hadn't really delved into it. I hadn't really expected uh, much. I much like Mo, I I was expecting a lot of a you know Yahtzee dice placement sort of sort of game, uh, and it really stepped up from uh, to be something more than that. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm very happy that we were able to uh, start working with Wise Wizard. I also really like the, the 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 that had some of the nicest like player screens I've ever seen. Like those, those were just beautiful looking. Uh, next, we took a break over at Brucadia. Hall was closing. Brucadia is still cool. Like it's just a neat place. Um, best pizza in Columbus I've had. There, there may be better, but best I've had. 
fantastic craft beer selection. Um, uh, it's a retro arcade where the games are free as long as you're buying beer or pizza, which is awesome. But we were so sore <laughs> from walking that like Sean and I played Big Buck Hunter or something. And by the end of the game, I didn't even care. I just wanted to sit back down. Um, and the other problem with Brucadia is it's got a very bar atmosphere and very loud music. And I don't know if I'm just getting old, but it was a little louder than I would like. And after walking all day and not being in the best shape, um, those chairs got to be there. Just bar stools. Yeah, hard wooden bar, st- bar stools didn't didn't do wonders for backs and bottoms and, and bodies. Yes. So we didn't stay there as long as I'd hoped to. Now, one of the things we did do is earlier in the day, I got an overview of play of a deck, uh, not a deck, but a trick taking game called Tome the Light Edition. This was from a company called Reversal Games, who was there with Kess Games' booth, and we did get a review copy to take with us. Now, when we got the the description of the game, I asked them, I said, you know what, card games aren't don't make for the best unboxings. Like, I'm, I'm showing off cards. And I said, are you cool with me opening this and skipping the unboxing? They said, sure. So here we go. I told you I was going to try to buy a card game or pick up a card game that we would be able to play while we had downtime at the at, at the con. Um, so we sat and tried this at Brucadia, and I got to say it went rough. Um, so the the lesson learned, and we've mentioned this before on the show when reviewing mainly indie games and Kickstarter games, is that learning the game from the game designer is very different than learning a game from the rule book. And the overview of play we got from the game designer made it sound very simple, clear, and easy. Once I read the rule book, I was just confused uh, to the fact that I was looking up FAQs on Board Game Geek and stuff. Um, so we were offered to do a demo next time. I'll do it. I'll, I want both. I want the person giving me the sales pitch on the game and actually see them teach me the game. So that would have been a bonus. Um, first play of this was rough though. Eventually once we, I don't know, was it the second game? I can't remember if we played a second game or if it was just like the second hand or second round, we started to get it. I will be talking more about this one. Um, it's a trick taker. It's one of those trick takers where when you play a card, it breaks the rules in some way. Except in this, every card broke the rules in a different way. So there was a lot going on. Yeah, the the, the weirdest thing was uh, there was a, a a Trump and not Trump, and things were some things were better than Trump, and some things were net were better than everything except Trump. Uh, and it, it got to be a little tricky that you get used to it, but yeah. it it took getting used to, and that was the the big sort of hurdle on that game getting over it was you know shoot okay is this better than trump or is this better than everything except trump and did you play was that actually trump or was that not trump and there we, you got a little it got a little tricky uh with that now the one thing i did like in it is i had what they called a chain mechanic so what it was is uh, you normally if you play a trick tricker you have to follow suit right well in this game you can play off suit anytime but if you played off suit you broke the chain and your card you played didn't have an ability and I thought that was neat like that. I, I loved like that was the one thing it brought to trick taking. I thought was brilliant. So it'd be like, I, I don't know if you were playing hearts and whatever card you broke the chain suddenly counted for double for points or something like it was neat. I like that mechanic. Yep. Now it was still fairly early. Um, so we headed back to the gaming hall. Hall C again. The gaming hall was open till like 1 a.m. So again, don't think that origins is just the hour the exhibits halls are open, which is from 10 to 6 always gaming going on um awesome star wars miniature game being played we walked by which was a recreation of the battle of hoth um check my twitter feed and my pictures i shared online for that it'll eventually be on instagram uh we went back to the back and wanted to see exactly what the open gaming gaming area is about tons of games lots of gamers tables were available so it wasn't packed but it was very busy i don't know why but it seemed like every third table was playing Suro, um which was a little weird we did take a quick look at the game library. It was kind of small. Um, so the the supplier of the game library for Origins this year was a local Columbus gaming group that has a, a group library. Now, I can't remember who provided the previous one. Mm-hmm. But there was um, there there was I, I think it might have been the Dice Tower library before. I don't know. It used to be a massive library. It was not small. It was not a small library, but it wasn't quite as comprehensive as I hoped. Um, the one game I was looking for was Aventuria because Hungry Gamer William had specifically said, hey, if we meet up, you have to teach me Aventuria. And I didn't want to bring a copy over the border, so I was really hoping they'd have it. And they did not have it. So we 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 did not actually take anything out of the game library, but it did seem impressive. Now, up next, I... 
broke out our copy of Elector Counts. This was another one I agreed that we didn't need to necessarily do an unboxing. I, and this was not at all what I expected. So thematically, I'm uh, Sean and I are both Warhammer fanboys, I would say, going back to first edition. So this is set after the end of Power Behind the Throne. Uh, after Carl Franz is dethroned and found out to be the cultist he is, and there's a power vacuum. So what you're knowing now is you are each playing a warring elector count of four of the major cities in, in the Warhammer world, expanding your territory and playing units to either attack other players' locations or guard your own. Now, what I didn't realize when I agreed to review, like when I asked for a copy, I just saw Warhammer card game. Awesome. Um, I guess it's a complete retheme of a Doctor Who card game. So I thought that was interesting. I don't know what the Doctor Who theme is, if you're all different Time Lords or what. And all I was expecting was a light card game, like a light, quick playing, let's play this at Brukiti over some beers. And it was not. This was a, a heavier, almost Euro-like card game with some interesting bluffing mechanics. It looks cool. Um, Just wasn't what we wanted. Like we wanted light casual and that's not what this is, which in the end could be a really good thing. So I, I, more plays needed. So once we review this, maybe I'll love it. Um, But it just wasn't that end of the day, light casual, let's play a card game. Yeah, no, it was it was really interesting, and I really enjoyed the game, but it it definitely wasn't the same sort of uh, light, fluffy, sit back, kick up, kick your feet up, and 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 toss some cards around. You you definitely yeah. needed to think and strategize and work at it. Uh, and yeah, Doctor Who, the card game, is uh, is the origin of that. Yeah, Deanna found it, man, but she knows she was really burned out at that point. Now, the one thing I did realize I should be doing at these con, or potentially should be doing at this con, was teaching games. That is something I, I feel I am good at, one of my skill sets, and something that fits well with the whole cardboard concierge thing. I saw so many people looking befuddled at rule books for games I know how to play that if we weren't burnt out and knowing we had to get going early in the morning, I felt like I should be walking over and going, hey, I am Motuzano, the tabletop bellhop, your cardboard concierge. Here's my card. Are you looking to learn how to play this game? I will happily teach you. No, I'm not here representing Gamar Origins. I'm just doing this as a, you know, friendly gamer looking to help other gamers out and hoping to spread the joy of this game. And I'm thinking that might be a great way to meet fans. Whereas our Origins this time was very much about interacting with publishers. I think this would have hit that fan angle, which I think was missed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there, there's a whole a whole aspect of our show that we didn't focus on in the in the slightest uh, because it had been so many years since we've interacted with publishers. Uh, that's really what the focus on this event became. Mm-hmm. Uh, and after walking around all day on our feet, it was uh, it, it was a tough sell to con- continue walking around uh, all night long as well. All right, that is the end of day two, day three, Friday. This was demo day. At this point, we had had most of the meetings we had scheduled. We had met with most of the publishers we had planned to to, to meet with. Um, This was a day to try new games for Deanna and I. For me, I had other plans. Uh, I started it off bright and early, well before the convention center floor opened at 8 a.m., uh, attending a world building for game masters, game designers, and authors. Uh, this was by a Dr. Richard States, S-T-A-A-T-S. Um, and again, 8 a.m. was very early for me to be up and listening to a panel, but he was very well attended. Uh, a lot of people were really interested in this, uh, and it was a good discussion of how to uh, build worlds from the two different uh perspectives of both top down and bottom up and he did a really good job of that uh unfortunately at the very end uh this gentleman who's been gaming for you know basically about as long as uh as long as you can be uh running rpgs uh drifted off into some of his own ideas about how worlds should be built or what should be included in worlds which may or may not have fit with other people's ideas um and things drifted a little bit and i have to say that the you know, the panel ended with a lot of people leaving rapidly rather than asking questions but the meat of his discussion the actual world building uh theories and uh, practices were quite interesting uh and uh, unfortunately i wish he had just kind of cut himself off a little bit sooner in that <laughs> talk 
So first demo I did uh, was I got to play What the Cup from the op. This is this is a neat game. So you got a plastic cup and you got a D12 and it's got a little D12 holder that go together. So you just pick it up, shake it, put it down and then tip the cup up like that was just a brilliant design. The, the D, excuse me, D12 holder. You then look at your cup and then the goal is to either be the player with the highest die or the lowest die at the end of the round. And there's a chip that says high, low on your turn. You get a hand of cards and your cards mess with things. Reroll a die, swap dice with players, pass dice left and right. And you're basically playing the cup game mixed with liars dice because you can BS all of this. So you can be like, I've got a 12. And then someone swaps you like, that's not a 12. You know, I, it, it was a fantastic quick party game, kind of like liars dice, but with the gamer and management cards in there that I guess it was amazing. I would have loved to have taken a copy home. Unfortunately, it's still on a boat. Like it was supposed to come out at Origins. It was supposed to be available. The op is extremely disappointed that they did not have it here because they know they have a hit with this one. This was great. I know local gamers who have already pre-ordered this after just seeing pictures of it on my feed. So what the cup? I I really want to bring this out. Um, One of our barbershop bar events, you're going to get to play this if you live in Windsor because it is really that good. Next, I discovered the finest fish from late night, last night games, sorry, last night games. Um, Google this at some point because this was one of the best looking games of the con. This was Azul with fish scales where you have these awesome looking goldfish and you are putting little wooden scales on them. I looked light, lighter than I'd say Azul, but looked solid where you're drafting different scales and some of the scales go to the fish market. You can trade with the fish market. And you're you you are trying to both make patterns so groups of the same color, as well as trying to fulfill like public like scoring opportunities, right? If you have this pattern on your fish, take the card. Uh, this looked great. I I think this would be another fantastic public play one. This is a get people's attention game. People are like, oh, what are you playing? They even had a giant version of this in the gaming hall where you had about an eight foot foot long fish with like foot long um, um scales you were putting on it. Um, would have loved to have brought a copy home, but good for last night games. They completely sold out by Saturday. So great looking fish game. I think Sean even saw this one. Not that you got to play it, but I, one of the better looking games of the con. Yeah, you guys were demoing that just as I got back from my uh, something or other. <laughs> what, one one of the was. things you went to do. <laughs> yes. Um, next was Star Realms Frontiers. Uh, this one was amusing because I headed over to the Star Frontiers or Star Realms booth. Because yet again, I kind of wanted a card game for us to play when downtime at the end of the day. And Electro Counts didn't cut it. And uh, Tome wasn't quite what we were hoping for. And I'm like, what's better than Star Realms, right? Something like that. And I'm like, maybe I'll finally pick up Hero Realms. Well, we sat down and we're like, okay, what's different on Frontiers? And the, the demo person's like, oh, it's 80 new cards. And it has all the cards for playing up to four players, including a new this. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I see the box there and I'm looking at the box and I'm like, oh, this says it plays solo and co-op. And I'm, they're like, oh, it does. And I'm like, OK. I'm like, so you can't demo this? And, and they're like, no, sorry. I, I was just taught how to do a 10 minute demo of Star Realms. So uh, volunteers, right? Like, I don't blame the volunteer. And I get that all that Wise Wizard wants to do is, is sell the base game, right? Like, like here, do the 10 minute experience, grab it. So it wasn't that busy at this time. So I asked, I said, can I read the instructions and we can play this? So Dan and I sat down and taught ourselves how to play Star Realm Frontiers cooperative. And we took out one of the, the bad guys where, depending on what cards were ditched, it fought. Anyway, it was awesome. I I I, I liked it because I played, I, I, it might even been thousands of games of Star Realms on the app. Eventually, back in the G Plus days, we played a ton of games of it. This was all new cards. So it wasn't the, oh, I recognize that card and I already know some good combos. So you got the, the discovery. Um, there's new things where you you need double two of a, a a card color in the in front before you can use use the ability. And like I said, the co-op mode. And the other awesome part is co-op. We could play three players. So I will say we walked away with a copy of that one. Um, now we had something to play during downtime. Um, walked by Cities of Venus from Tin Robot. Look at this one. This just looks awesome. This is this is obviously on the terraforming Mars, terraforming Venus, like. I, the terraforming game seemed to be a thing. Awesome components, two layered playing boards, big mining robot minis that actually hold little spaceship spaceman meeples. 
Um, at this point, it's pre-order only, so take a look at that. I think you hit up another panel at this point. Yeah, so at this point, I got to see one of the uh, special guests of the con, uh, Kevin J. Anderson, who had a talk on called Building My First Lightsaber, which, as he stated immediately at the top of the thing, was not going to inform us on how to actually use kyber crystals and build a lightsaber. Uh, it was the history of how he got into writing and how he developed his career and became the remarkably prolific writer that he is today. Um, it's it's an, a remarkable just how many uh, books and, and series and, and things he has been a part mm. of throughout his career, uh, both Star Wars, which is a passion of Moe's in particular, uh, but also Dune, which is, is a passion of both mine and Moe's. Yep. Um, uh, but interestingly, I had, I had always avoided the non, uh, Frank Herbert dunes. I felt that, you know, it was, it was just wrong to sort of continue. Uh, but I wasn't aware of, uh, the history of documents that existed from Frank Herbert, uh, that were in the possession of both his son and, uh, Kevin Anderson, uh, that they used to develop all these future books. Uh, and so he actually, uh, among other things, throughout his talk, uh, reignited my interest in the Dune series mm -hmm. beyond the books that were written by Frank himself before his uh, far too early passing. Uh, so, yeah, no, Kevin J. Anderson is a fantastic speaker, uh, and I do recommend uh, if you enjoy his work or sci fi in general uh, or even some fantasy uh, as an author, he, he is a wonderful speaker. Uh, and it was well worth the time spent listening to his uh, his talk. And to follow that up, a terrible shout out to the company that was selling lightsabers because, man, they were amazing. But I didn't make a note or take a picture. And it was just funny because we went to the booth and I'm like, all right, they, they look cool. And I picked one up and I was just like, oh, my God, that feels so good. And then I'm like, Deanna, you got to pick this up. And she picked it up. She's like, oh, yeah, OK, <laughs> I understand why people might want one of these. I'm sorry, I don't have the name of the lightsaber company was there. I, I That wasn't one I was going to call out. But the fact that he talked about my first lightsaber made me think, and I want one of these lightsabers. Really nice. Yeah. Um, another big one to me is Dragon Dice is back. Now, I guess they reclaimed the license in like 2000 and it's taken and there were Kickstarters and it's taken this long to republish all the original TSR stuff. So Dragon Dice was a D&D &D themed collectible dice game put out by TSR kind of just before they cracked. Um, one of the things I love that came with TSR dice bags, which I have a bunch of because I got a ton of these um, in the States at Meyer FYE, like dirt cheap at the time because the TSR folded. Well, this is a new company that has taken the game, uh, streamlined it. The main things they did is they made the rares less powerful, so it wasn't about buy the biggest thing. They also rebalanced some of the other stuff. What I liked is they re, uh, repackaged everything so that instead of buying a box of dragon dice that could come with any of the factions, you would now at least buy a faction pack, so every die in there is, say, an orc or a fire elf. So you're still getting random fire elves, but at least you know you're getting all fire elves, which is way better. Um, what I like is they've now they're done with TSR. They've done all the TSR classics. It's all back out. You can get it. So they have published a new two player starter set. They have produced a really awesome looking battle mat to play on that replaces the piece of paper that comes in the game. And they have now done two new factions, completely new factions that didn't exist before. So we um, are bringing home or did bring home a copy of the starter set and the play mat. So I am looking forward to it because it is fully compatible with the original Dragon Dice of at least getting some use out of my old dice after trying the game. Quick shout out to the Mimic boxes from Hrothgar's Horde. Uh, check out my, my, my social media pictures for that. It was a good picture of Deanna getting bit by one. Uh, we stopped by Geekify. This is a company that upgrades things, but interestingly, upgrades books. You don't see that a lot. You hear about board game upgrades all the time. Now, we are a Geekify affiliate, so full disclosure here. And the main thing we did at that booth is snap some pictures of some of their awesome stuff so we can promote their, their affiliates. Uh, what I would call it is rebinding books with either leather or wooden covers. Their Narnia book with the wooden doors that open were amazing. They also do cloth maps and pages of the Necronomicon. Some beautiful, beautiful stuff there. Look forward to uh, seeing uh, pics from, I think, all three of us probably <laughs> coming yeah, up on, probably. Uh, on content. Oh, so nice. They had a copy of um, 
I don't know what expansion was. I can't remember. It was a Tales of the Yawning Portal, but it, it had the the um, Kuma Horrors green mouth put into the cover. Oh, my God, that looked amazing. Tomb of Annihilation. Yes, it was a copy of Tomb of Annihilation with with the green mouth for, for any old school D&D fans will know that one. Um, then I found this awesome booth and the company was called All Game Terrain. And I got to say, to me, this is one of the coolest demos of the con. Now, you have to be in the miniatures to appreciate this, but you literally went to this booth and created a base for your miniatures. They gave you a piece of MDF. They had bits of twigs. They had all of their, their scenery bits there. They're flocking and, and their spray glue. And you literally sat there and made a scenic base. You made a small diorama at the con as the demo, which you got to take home. And they gave you this nice like bag to try to protect it. I thought that was awesome. I just thought that was so cool. Like that, that is like, yeah, getting demo games cool, but like you walk home with the thing. And then in the gaming room was a paint and play or a paint and take. So you could go in the gaming hall and paint up your, your Reaper bones mini and then bring it over to this booth and base it, which I just thought was awesome. So I met up with them. I was talking to them and it was ironic because I, I gave them a sales pitch. And as part of my sales pitch, I tend to mention that we like to recommend games. And I mentioned that like, Oh, you could go to Woodland Scenics and go get it at Walmart pretty cheap, or you could go to the Army Painter. And then I got their business card, and it ends up this is a rebranding of Woodland Scenics. It is now their gamer division of Woodland Scenics. And the publisher or, or company rep was like, well, you nailed it because you already mentioned our company name in your <laughs> pitch. So it's like, did you practice that? Was, was that part of it? And I'm, I'm like, no, I just made it up on the spot. <laughs> So that was awesome. So you can expect me to possibly be talking about scenery again in the future. I love making scenery. It's not something I want to do, but they they want us to work with them. Like, let me send stuff and you can make scenery. And I'm like, I haven't miniature gamed in so long. Don't get me back into it. I can't afford it. Yep. I uh, was very tempted by Pirate Borg. They had a fantastic display. They were doing short demos. They had They had both a pirate ship battle with two wooden ships with miniatures as well as a zoomed out, you know, the naval battle going on. Tempted by that. Um, Stop by Snow Bright Studios. This is a indie publisher, a new publisher. They had this awesome booth where they had like a park bench set up, like two park benches around the table with like a fake stream. Like it was like the most peaceful booth ever. Um, They were showing off birds of a feather, Western North America. Uh, Deanna tried that, and we walked away with a review copy of that. And more about that one later, because that's another one we cracked open. Uh, Shauna and I then hit up the um, Arcane Wonders booth and tried out Air, Land, and Sea, or Critters at War. These are literally the same game, depending on if you want a World War II themed game or if you prefer the lighter bunch of animals fighting each other with tanks, which I thought was cool. I had heard good things about Air, Land, and Sea. Lots of people recommended it to me, and I've got to say uh, they were right. Like, like this was an excellent tug of war game. Yeah, no, this was this was fun. Uh, as much as I have never been a fan of inserting animals in just for the sake of it, uh, it made sense. It was uh, mm -hmm. it was it was a nice balance uh, against the World War II theme, which also really wouldn't interest me at all. Uh, the the animals certainly uh, felt a little nicer as a, as a result uh and it was a it was a good solid uh mechanic involved in the game so i look forward to uh trying that yeah we've even got lobbyists in our chat room here on chat on twitch uh shout note their love of land air and sea definitely impressed uh probably would have brought a copy home but they sold out so good on arcane wonders there um also at the arcane wonders booth we got to look at mother of frankenstein oh my gosh does that look amazing um, this is a puzzle game that there are three chapters of. They're all out now. The third chapter released. Um, this would fit in great with our escape room and a box style coverage. These are uh, a heavier puzzle game where you're learning about Mary Shelley. Like um, uh, this looked great. Um, uh, they weren't doing review copies at the con, but this is something we might be able to work with them in the future. We do now have a contact at Arcane Wonders. So maybe something we'll get into the future because I think it's a perfect fit for us. Uh, in particular, that series, the 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 Mother of Frankenstein series, I think will go great with all of our, you know, La Famiglia and other escape room in a box and puzzle games we were do. Yeah, I mean, with that this game, between all three volumes, you're looking at 10 to 15 hours, including both 2D and 3D uh, jigsaw puzzles. It's it's really uh, involved and, and beautiful. Like they really yeah. put a lot of amazing work 
into the art for that. Then all three of us played a full game, not just a demo, a picture perfect. And I, I think Sean's photography kills came in play because <laughs> he destroyed us. I was terrible at it. Um, that was a solid game. Like I like I thought it was gonna be more gimmicky than it was. And there was the very gimmicky part of you don't score based on your board in front of you, but rather the picture you take with your phone, which I gotta say actually is brilliant. Like it works so well because there was stuff I set up. That from my eyes, looking at my board, I thought for sure you couldn't see the dog. It was hidden behind the dude in the wheelchair. But then when I look at my camera, I'm like, oh, no, there's the damn dog's face. So really neat game. Yeah, I'm, I I like the game. Um, it's very interesting. It does a lot of, of what I sort of expected of it. Uh, I'd be interested. I'll be interested to see how replayable it is. Now, the way that you change things up, you're not you're never going to uh, do the same setup twice mm -hmm. with any real ease because of the the interesting uh shuffle and and, and uh folder mechanic that it uses but again there's still even though even though the setup is going to be different there's a lot of sameness to it uh and i'm not sure how interesting it is going to be long term i'm, I'm not saying yep. it isn't i just i want to experience it more to to feel whether or not i it wears out on me quickly or not yeah, at this point, I, we did not bring a copy. Like I said, Arcane Wonders was not doing review copies at Origins. It's fair. Totally legit. Um, so I, if someone locally had this, I would happily play it again. Um, right now, if they did offer us to review it, I would say yes, but I wouldn't be rushing out to buy it. I will point out. Now, the one thing with that game is there are a ton of expansions, and I got to say, I'd feel like a have or have not, though. Like I kind of feel like I'd want them all, even though I know most of them just add more people. So I don't know. Uh, Stop by the DCC booth. They had a very impressive boo booth with a, a ziggurat erected in the middle of their booth, which was cool. Um, and I had to remind myself we're not really playing or reviewing RPGs now. Um, similarly, I drooled over the new Dune Adventures in the Aperium Agents of Dune box set. Oh, my God, it's a beginner box, but it's not. So it's it's an introduction to the game. It gives you everything you need to play. Not a one shot, not a game, but a full campaign. And then also includes a PDF of the full rule book so you can keep going. I don't think I've ever seen a campaign in a box that wasn't meant for longtime fans of the game that already have all the stuff. Like that, that just fascinated me. As Sean already mentioned, we're both fans of Doom. So tempted. Uh, like that's from Modiphius, so I should call out who it is. Modiphius puts out this Agents of Dune, and it did end up winning one of the Origin Awards as well. So that made me even more tempted to pick it up. Yeah, that was fantastic. Uh, and then uh, I stepped out and att attended a live play version of Fill in the Game. This is a self-published party game that was on the floor at the uh, in the exhibit hall. And it's a sort of a game of hilarity and embarrassment. It really suited itself well to the live on stage sort of game where they invited up three players uh, and the p designer of the game hosted the game and did scoring while uh while three participants from the audience played the game and it's literally you pick out a card you pick top or bottom do what it says on the card uh which is generally filling in a blank to have to do something or a rule that is set up for the rest of the game or you know various fun party game type things it just certainly mm -hmm. wasn't something that we would normally involve ourselves in but i think it was a great way to show off their game for people who are interested in that type of party game, uh, doing it on sta on a stage like that really showed the strengths of the game for people who right. love that kind of improv party game. And that was fill in the game. Uh, next, I tried out a Gladiator game called For Glory. This is from Spielcraft Games, recently ended on Kickstarter. And the big thing the designer explained was, I like games like Magic. But combat's too simple. It's who has the highest number defeats the other person. Once you defeat all their monsters, you start doing damage to the other player. They didn't want that. They wanted a more detailed combat system. And that's what they created and then built a game around it that was semi-deck building where you have a whole Ludus phase where you're improving. You, you've got three different matches to send your gladiators to. You're upgrading your gladiators. You're buying new gladiators. Um, looked pretty neat. Uh, seemed very solid. With the three different arenas, it reminded me a bit of Blood Bowl Team Manager, where you would play out different cards, and there was a whole initiative system where you would attack with one gladiator and do something in an enemy, and then they'd do something. 
It looked pretty neat, looked interesting. This um, They had copies there at the con, but didn't have a lot of them. Um, this looked like an interesting one. If you're into gladiators, the main thing they were pushing is a new expansion for it, which included more gladiators. Uh, Deanna specifically noted as a classics major, they didn't seem to have bungled things. So they did take some artistic liberty, but it's not like the women were half naked and the naming wasn't ridiculously out of period. So there was nothing offensive about the game, which is it was seems like it was handled pretty well. So if you're into that kind of game, it looked worth checking out. Uh, we did stop by the free RPG day booth um, and I picked up quick starts for Root, Avatar and Dragonbane. Which is awesome, because usually when I go to Origins, I miss out completely on free RPG day. So it was cool that they had a booth for it at the con. Next, I headed over to Elf Creek Games with Deanna, and we checked out a prototype of Santa's Workshop 2nd Edition. And this has me hyped. This looks great. This looks like a really solid worker placement game with some cool thematic elements. Um, things like you are trying to collect sets of reindeer, and the more reindeer of different name you have, the more points you get. And you're trying to decorate a tree. And every time you put an ornament on, you get points for what you covered up. But then there's also area control scoring for whoever has the most ornaments on the tree. And then you're actually converting. You're having to make toys in the workshop and having to get resources to fill out orders. And if you mess it up, you get coal instead. And I've got to say, that just seemed really neat. Um, there were actually a couple of winter and, and holiday themed games. I'll mention another one in a bit. And I thought that was neat that like holiday games are becoming more of a thing. Now, what impressed me the most is after we got this short demo. Now, this game didn't even have a cover at this point. That's how much of a prototype it is. Now, it is a second edition of a game. The original was a very dry Euro from Rio Grande games. And if anyone knows Rio Grande, you know what I mean by a dry Rio Grande Euro. Well, they've they've re, they spiced it up a bit. This This seems to be better. But the other thing they did is they don't want someone to walk into Walmart or whatever and buy this medium Euro for their eight-year-old. Something we talked about on recent podcast episodes about games that don't quite fit. I can't remember the name of our episode. I should have threw that in the notes. The the the, spe the, the actual episode where we talk about this, we we're talking about the number of games that have come out that, that look like they're for kids and they're not. Well, what they did here is they realized this could happen. So they included two games. On the other side of the board is a game where you play elves decorating a tree. And really simple, uses some dice, some set collection, and you get this kid's game. And I got to say, that was really cool. I'm like, I'm like someone realizing this could be a problem. Plus, you get two games out of one. You're getting a full, you know, heavier Euro game and a game you can play with your family and kids. And that was episode 207. Looks like kids games, but they're not. There you go. Deanna just tossed it in the chat at the same time, too. So while we were at Elk Creek, we also got a super short demo of Merchants of the Dark Road. As a fantastic looking game, especially with the upgraded components. Now, one thing that's a little odd to me, though, is how Elf Creek sells their games. Their marketing idea is to sell lots of small packaged upgrades. There's no one big upgrade kit for this game. It's you can buy upgrade lanterns. You can buy upgraded carts. You can buy upgraded two layer player board. You can buy upgraded metal coins. You can buy and it just seemed weird way to do it. But they were doing it and it seemed to be working like people were buying different things. But like, I just feel like I would want it all if I didn't have all of it. Like, like I, I'd feel like I'm missing out and, and I'd at least want most of it. Like the lanterns were one of my favorite board game components I've ever seen. I just want those lanterns. I'll, I'll use them in D&D &D games or something. They're just awesome looking. The metal coins were awesome. They, they were all different shapes. They felt great. I don't know. It's just weird, but I, I like, I guess it makes the game more accessible to more people. So like you can spend as much as you can afford. Like if you can only afford one upgrade, yeah, get the lanterns. Or if you can only afford that, get that. If you've got the money, buy all in. It was actually pretty interesting. Now they, this company also does honey buzz and it was the same thing. There was a million boxes of little things I could buy for honey buzz. Wanted to do a demo, but this is another one like the capstone booth. It, there was no space to try it all weekend. So this was our first time actually seeing Elf Creek at a con. So we did get some contact info and we are hoping to work with them in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Now, next up, we finally got to try Shobu. This is not a new game. This, this is something older that's been out for a while. I've been so interested in since I first heard about it. The, this game sounds brilliant. So Deanna and I actually sat down and played and I think we were both instantly hooked. 
Um, by the end of the weekend, we ended up picking this up along with um, with the follow up, which is Boop, which I didn't realize until we got home that Boop was a follow up to Shobu by a similar design team. Um, we also picked up a couple, other, a couple other Smirk and Dagger and Smirk and Laughter games, a couple which we'll call out in a bit, but we we, we brought home quite a bit from them, which was kind of cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was uh, fantastic. Uh, and one, uh, while, while Mo was doing that, I ducked off yet again over to the second stage uh, where I got in a comedy show and a, a concert. Uh, the comedy show had been a last minute edition. Uh, posters went up and they put up, they were the, the con advertised it quite freely, but not during the, uh, the pre show. It wasn't like it wasn't mentioned anywhere until uh, we arrived on site. Uh, there was two comics and a host, uh, and I have to say, I I, I certainly I, I enjoyed the headliner greatly. He had a really good, solid board game content, tabletop content, uh, RPGs and board games uh, content set uh, that was very solid and super enjoyable. Um, the opener I didn't enjoy quite as much, and unfortunately, his content was a little uh, limited because I saw him the next day doing. Uh, he actually did some filler for the cosplay show uh, while the judges were deliberating, and it was the exact same set as his yeah. show before, and that was unfortunate. Uh, but uh, the headliner was definitely worth it, and I completely forgot to write down. Uh, it's in my phone as I pull up the name of the headliner. It's Grant Lyon, uh, L-Y-O-N. Grant Lyon was the headliner who had a really great tabletop set and then the concert was uh 2d6 was the name of the artists uh two gentlemen who do sort of rap pop uh themed songs about tabletop experiences and things and it was fun uh, unfortunately the audio system set up in the second hall was not doing them any favors uh, so it was it was fun, but it was fun as a let's all just sort of be silly rather than enjoy the quality of music. Next game I checked out was Distilled. Um, we had met with the the designer at the the preview event, but actually got a little bit of a demo here. A uh, super impressive game. Loved how much the mechanics were tied to the theme. I was not expecting that. I I don't know what I was expecting. But I was not expecting it to be so well tied in, especially the whole mashing your ingredients together, losing your top bottom, the way you buy different bottles and different barrels and you can label your things differently. Really impressive looking game. This one looks really good. And based on social media and even our chat here tonight, this seems to be the one that uh, Tabletop Bell Hub fans are most excited to hear about. So I have already recorded an unboxing of that one. We'll probably get that up in the next week or so. And looking forward to getting that to the table. So you should be hearing about Distilled in the coming weeks pretty quickly. Um, after the hall closed, we did have dinner with Mark from Grand Gamers Guild at a, a rather nice place called The Keep, where I had some steak, very good steak. And we got to explore a bit more of Columbus's downtown. Anytime I've gone to Origins, I've always went north on North High Street. This time we got to go south and kind of see what's down there. Um, much more of a business district, more high-end boutiques. I did see a brewery that at some point I'm going to have to hit when I was in Columbus, but we didn't have time for that because we got back to the con center just in time for the Origin Awards. Now, I've always paid attention to the Origin Awards. I know various content creators and fans of board games have different um, opinions on award shows. Personally, I love them, and I think they were a great way to hear about games you might not have heard about otherwise. And what an award show like that does is tells me what to now go look at on the floor the next day. That's what I appreciate them for. Now, what I did do is tried to live tweet them, which kind of worked. I, I fell behind a bit because uh, they managed to sneak in a whole award show in an hour, which was really impressive. Uh, what ended up being fortuitous is I guess I was the only one in the world to live tweet it and got the information out before Gamma even did. So which led to a bunch of Twitter followers and nice comments and, and retweets. Yeah, they were actually streaming it on Twitch, but uh, again, if, unless you happen to know which channel it was that was sponsoring and doing sponsored streams for Origins, because Origins doesn't have their own channel, yeah. so it was, uh, there was some uh, six sides of 
Yeah, I don't know. It was uh, another content creator. Yeah, I it was don't. a content six sides of something. And it was their name, and I, I and I didn't get it. It was just mentioned briefly. They didn't even have any uh, branding up anywhere. Uh, so they were streaming it on their channel, and apparently Origins would later put it onto the Origins game page. But who knows when that will be? Because it will have yeah. to be you know downloaded and edited and all that stuff. Uh, so the fact that we were the only ones putting that content out live uh, to a major pub uh populace was odd and nice yeah worked out well so now i'm not going to go through the whole origins awards but i'm sure people care so just check out my twitter feed uh at tabletop bellhop you can even search uh hashtag origins awards um what i'm going to do is i'm going to call it the ones i think are most worth noting for people who listen to our show so first up huge congratulations to martin wallace for being inducted to the gamma hall of fame and our talsorian games for having cyberpunk inducted into the hall of fame and 1829 which is the first ever 18xx game which started a genre next was creature comforts from kid table board game that got the best social or light strategy game and this is one where once i heard about the award we went and did a demo dead reckoning won best thematic game that is from aeg Scout from Oink won the best card game, which unfortunately wasn't being shown at the con, so I didn't get to check that out. Coyote and Crow, well-deserving, best RPG. Agents of Dune from Nodifius, that was that supplement, and now I want it even more. Uh, the Retailer Game of the Year. So this is all of the Gamma retailers, which is a large group. The, the majority of Gamma members are either publishers or retailers. They voted on their best game, and that was Boop. And man, were there a lot of excited people when Boop won. They were very loud. And I got to say, well-deserving. Now, after the awards, we went back to Barley's for some beers and to play some games. We did play a three-player co-op game of Star Realms Frontiers, which I realize that Star Realms Frontiers shouldn't be a light party card game. But for us, it is because we've all played so much Star Realms. Now, it was interesting to see what the new cards they did. Um, what I love the most is I now have a copy of Star Realms that I can play three player and and have fun because you could play a three player before, but the whole and eliminate the player on your right or left just wasn't all that great. So glad I picked up a copy of that. Um, we then went back to our hotel at the Hilton and played a game of Birds of a Feather. So I mentioned this one earlier. So what this is, this is a bird watching game, obviously kind of spurred on the, the success of games like Wingspan. Fair enough. Fantastic bird art. Features this particular version features birds of part of North America. Unfortunately, I don't have them in my notes right now. And what it is, you get a huge mitt full of birds and you decide what birds have flocked to the area. Now, every bird has a different, not every bird has a different biome, but there are different biomes. And you're going to put the cards down. Sorry, Northwestern America. That's what it was. So birds, you're going to put a card down and then you reveal them. Well, every bird that's at the same biome as where the bird you put down, you see. And you just take a checklist and you check off. I saw a bird. Then those birds linger and you play a second card. You flip those over. Now, every bird on the table that's in the same biome you played, you then check off. So you can kind of see where some of the birds are lingering. So you try to play new birds to help you see birds you hadn't seen yet. And then the lingering birds fly away and a new set of birds flock in. And you keep doing that until you've seen, I don't know how many rounds it was, played so many rounds. And then you compare who saw the most of different sets. Super simple, beautiful looking game that I think is going to be amazing or public play events because of its its approachability. This is a game anyone can play. You don't have to be a gamer. You don't have to understand cards. Everyone understands. I went to the forest. I get to see the birds that are also in the forest. It's that simple. Another nice aspect of this is it is a very green game from a very green publisher. Uh, no plastic at all in the game or in the game components. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, again, it's a very green uh, concept with bird, you know, ins inspiring bird watching as well so that was fantastic uh and nice to see as well everything from you know the cards being wrapped in a paper band to no plastic wrap around the game itself yeah, and all the cards were recycled paper too yeah as well as the box that was it for day three so day four was another chill day this was explore more of the hall do more demos hang out and relax a chill day um started off with running into the badger um, Jason Paul McCartan, longtime uh, friend of mine, fan of, of everything we did, met on G Plush, um, a, a very amusing Scottish gentleman. 
uh, who happens to live in the area. So I am so glad he made it out. Jason's had some some problems lately, and friends and friends encouraged him to come out, and he was glad he did. So it was awesome running to him. Um, the one thing that shocked me is this was Saturday. Saturday at Origins is the one day where you might want to stay in your hotel room if you have anxiety issues. And for Origins, this is the slowest Saturday I've ever seen. Now, I get it. This is post-COVID Origins or uh, post-lockdown, post-lockdown Origins. Post-lockdown Origins. And yes, we know Panda, the, the COVID is still around. It is now your endemic. I, I but, will um, say that while uh, it was a very mixed bag of masking, uh, there was a significant num- amount of masking. Um, yep. I, I personally, I had masks with me. I did not wear them, uh, but I was literally prepared to whip them out. Should I get into a point where I'm feel I was feeling, you know, crowded and, and, but it never got to the point where I was yep. feeling crowded. Uh, it was very spacious for the amount of people present. Yep. So one of the things I took advantage of is the fact Dr. Wits, the designer, Wix, sorry, designer of Robotech Reconstruction was present. So I headed back to the the Strange Machine Games booth and got a bit of an overview. Now, this is the Robotech coin game I mentioned before. Um, I got to say, compared to other coin games I played, this seemed much simpler, but not in a bad way. Like this seemed much more approachable. Um, What I loved is it fit the theme well. Um, It's set just after the Robotech war with the various factions, each trying to establish themselves. So you have basically the the. The RDF just trying to keep the peace. You've got the the expeditionary force trying to to infiltrate and make Zentradi controlled areas. You've got the Minmay's group of populists who are just sick of being under military control and want the RDF out. Like it was really neat. There are four factions. Each faction had a half partner. And like every coin game, it's one of those where your two partners are gonna have to work together. But you don't want to help too much or the other player will win the game. So you help out until you don't. Um, There was events that fit the storyline. There was a neat thing to make sure that like certain events didn't happen too early. So at the end of each round, players got new cards in their hand. I am really looking forward to checking this out. This looks like it could be a fantastic Robotech game. Then all of us kind of got in a quick demo of Atlantis Rising. This is back at Elf Creek Games. It was a game we saw the other day wasn't available. This looks neat. It's a cooperative worker placement game with a huge push your luck element, which I thought was really interesting. So you have like this island with these spike spokes coming out of it that have multiple worker placement spots on them. And the closer you point to the end of the point, the, the farthest from the shore, the more you get. So if you place right on the very end, you might get six resources, where if you place up by the, the center of the island, you might only get one. Well, the whole thing is you place all your workers out, but then you start flipping over cards pandemic style and the island starts to sink because it is Atlantis. And while those workers that are on the far away spots on the shore have a good chance of drowning and you don't get anything, which I thought was fascinating. There was some set collection elements and there was a sci-fi theme because you were basically trying to build a Stargate by spending resources to build parts of it to eventually get everyone off the island. Really neat looking game. Looking forward to um, watching that game, see how it progresses and hopefully hearing back from Elf Creek and working with them in the future. Yeah, this one had a lot going on. Uh, It was certainly not a uh, quick and easy, simple game. Uh, There were a lot of moving pieces to it. Uh, But that said, I think it was an interesting uh, mechanic and the way of sort of, you know, forcing you to to push your luck if you wanted more reward for less cost. Uh, and knowing that you could uh, bust before you even get a chance to roll that dice. Uh, next one was Bah Humbug. We did a demo of this. This is cool. This is, it, it, It's 12 games in one box. And what it is, it's a deck of cards. 12 12s, 11 11s, 10 10s based on the 12 days of Christmas. Now, the game I know that also does this is the Great Talmudi that has 13 13s, 12 12s. So there were a number of games that were shedding games in that, but the games in this seemed really solid. It was also a fantastic example of multi-use cards where like the, the, the there's this clock piece that you use to show your, your turn thing. But in the next game, that exact same piece is then used instead to be flipped like a coin. And then the card that you used as a calendar for one game, you flip over and is now a crate to hold goods for another game. This looked really neat. Um, This was the only prototype we brought home because we thought this was so cool. And I think it's something people are going to overlook. And I want to help the publisher out to get the word about this. 
And while one of the games is you got to be the bellhop, and well, I, the game included a bellhop meeple, so I kind of couldn't turn that one down. So I look forward to checking out Bah Humbug again. It's just pre-production, but like this was the one you know we we took a pre-Kickstarter home because this looks neat. Yeah, and this is this is great, and it supports a lot of different designers, uh, both Canadian and international. Uh, it was a really interesting and solid you know, holiday game uh, that you could play with gamers and grandma. Yeah. And, and uh, every, each of the 12 games was designed by something else. And if you purchase the game as a gift, they are going to send you a new game to play every December, which I thought was really cute. Uh, next, Ian and I stopped by the Gigamic booth or Gigamic. I, I've heard it pronounced a bunch of different ways and tried out Kowale. It's Q-A-W-A-L-E. This was Mancala meets Connect 4. It's an abstract strategy game where you're going to put out a piece of your color, then you're going to pick up that stack and you're going to drop them. Moncala style, orthogonally adjacent, trying to get four in a row. Really dug that game. Looks beautiful. Uh, we probably would have gotten a copy of this, but at this point, we already had Boop, Shobu, and Zensu, which are all abstract strategy. Two-player games kind of felt we probably had enough of those to bring home for one trip. But that's one I'm probably going to look to pick up on my own or possibly approach them next year. Uh, Deanna did a demo of Wicked and Wise. This was a storybook based deck builder from Weird Giraffe Games. Looked really busy. Um, one player is playing a dragon. The other player is playing a mouse. It looked like it had some neat asymmetry to it. Um, the only problem we saw with this game is it looked very busy for a deck builder with lots of things you had to put in special spots. And they sold this play map for it completely separately. And it really looked like you would want both together. So I call it a deck builder. I keep calling this one a deck builder. It's a trick-taking game. A trick-taking game where you have a mouse versus a dragon. The problem is like a trick-taking game that requires multiple spots to put cards. So we felt that one needed the playmat. It seemed like it would have been included. Um, so we did get to check it out. So that's one we'll be watching now. Sean has a game from them. Was that... um? What was, was the name the of that? Sorcerer, uh, a study in sorcery. A study in sorcery. There we go. Uh, it was it was similar in that the playmat really was something that I was glad I got as a backer. I wouldn't have wanted to play the game because there was just enough fiddly setup that the playmat made super simple, but would have been a pain to do on a plane table. And I think yeah. this that that seems to be a, a bit of a theme in their games from that publishing group. Uh, next, we took a quick look at Mistwind. Uh, this was just a prototype from First Fish Games. Looked neat, but we didn't stick it around because, in general, we're not looking at reviewing prototypes anymore. Of course, the exception to the rule being about Humbug. Um, then D and I sat down to a game of Octopus's Garden. Now, this is from Canadian publisher Maple Games. It was being shown off at the Colossal Games booth. I don't know if that was some kind of collaboration or whatever. This is another abstract strategy game. Uh, plays four players about organizing kelp, coral, trash, and treasure on your player board. Now, what I'd like the most in this is they had a neat pearl-based economy where clams, the more clams you have mean the more pearls you get, which makes it easier to draft tiles. But every, every round, but at the end of the game, every clam you have is negative points. So at some point, you want to send in sea stars to eat them before the end of the game. I thought that was neat. And it had a drafting mechanic I hadn't seen before where you get a grid that looks like, you know, a tic-tac-toe board, three by three grid, where you can take one horizontal row or column. And I thought that was neat because the trash, for example, were negative points at the end of the game. But once it got to be trash, you had to take some to be able to get the other tiles you wanted. So that one looked really solid. Did not bring that one home. But I, I recommend if you are into abstract strategy games, you kind of had like a, like a Zool or stuff like that. Check out Octopus's Garden. Next up, Sean was here for this one. We got a short demo of Ahoy from Leader Games. Now, Root is one of those games where it fits that looks like a kid's game, but they're not thing. Well, Leader Games is well aware of that because they've got complaints and negative reviews from people who bought it because of the cute Kyle Farron animal art on it and then got a coin game, basically. Uh, so what they wanted to do was make a game for that market. So they wanted to make a lighter, easier to approach version i wouldn't say of root because it's a very different game but of a kind of coin different style game so what this one is is there are only two different factions to learn so there's a pickup and deliver faction and then there's an area majority faction 
Well, if you're only playing two players, you just play with the two pick up and deliver. Once you add a third player, you then throw in the area majority faction. If you play four, you have two of each. So I thought that was neat. So what factions are in play depend on player count. This seemed really solid. Um, they basically offered us a damage copy, but said we'll ship us a new one. So look forward to a a uh, ahoy review sometime in the future. And I think it's unfair to uh, compare this one to to Root. I mean, they're from the same the same company, but uh, you know, it's it, they are not uh, the the Root and Light Root. They are definitely different enough. Uh, but just for a different, entering the different market, they want they want to hit that mm -hmm. uh, the lighter gamers with uh, with Ahoy. Uh, and if you like Root, you're probably liking the heavier games and, and wouldn't be interested in Ahoy. Yep, totally fair. Now, one of our pieces of homework is before we do reach back out to them, play Root. I've got a copy. It's on the pile of shame. If it was on the pile of obligation, it'd be done already. I think it kind of shifted that way. Uh, next, we learned about Victorum from Chip Theory Games, which Deanna wanted badly but did not. Uh, this is a super heavy solo game. Amazing components. Anyone who's seen chip theory games knows what I'm talking about. Actual like lead chips and, and components and maps and oh, this looked amazing. Um, but when is Deanna going to sit down and play through an epic solo campaign with hours and hours of gameplay? Um, looks great. We don't really do solo games. Like, like there's no, this probably would never hit the table. Deanna would never take the, she would feel guilty playing a solo game instead of doing something else. Um, we also got a bit more info on Too Many Bones. That has been on my wish list since I first saw it. Stays on my wish list. Did a quick demo of Mind Your Business. This is a card-driven path-building game I ended up snagging two copies of so we can play four players. This looks like a great lighter game, perfect for barbershop bar events, super approachable, where you got a grid of things and you're trying to line up the mines so that they dump into your cart. Then it finally hit up Kids Table Ward Games because there was finally space at their booth to get in there. I uh, got a quick demo of Creature Comforts and Fossil. Both look rather good. Creature Comforts, I gotta say, seems to be the best, my first worker placement game. Now, I don't know if it will be enough for us, but it does look like it might have enough depth to keep gamers engaged. Didn't get a full game, would take that to know. But Fossil looked gone. awesome. Like, it, it is an awesomely toyetic game. It's a, it's a collection game, set collection game, where you are trying to collect dinosaur fossils and put them on and make your dinosaur displays, but you also need to have enough clay to make a cast. But the whole thing here is this mound of dirt with a bunch of plastic tiles on top that you are sh removing, shifting, and sliding till you eventually get to the hole where you actually use a set of tweezers to pull out the dinosaur bone you want. Oh, I might have said the wrong one. Sorry, plaster, not clay. And then we got to learn about their latest game called In Too Deep. Now, this is the heaviest game by Kids Table Board Games to date. This looks extremely fascinating. This is a, a hidden role game where you are hacking other players' minds. You're hacking other characters' minds and trying to dive deep into their heads without going too deep oh that makes sense sorry dan just corrected me this was at the kids table board game booth but it was burnt island burnt island was sharing a booth with kids table board games so that's my bad they were all at the same physical spot so this is the latest game from burnt island which makes more sense burnt island did endeavor um so this this just looked it looked awesome it had a cyberpunk the neon look hacking other players brains but it, as you get deeper into hacking, you start getting these deepness points. And at the end of the game, the player who's deepest ends up being the traitor. But the thing is, you never know who's deepest, like who's in too deep. That's the theme of the game. So like you might know you have eight points and you think Sean only has six, but you're, you're convinced you're the one who's in too deep. So you'll actually change the way you're trying to play. Follow the Mountain King was there. I think this might not be out yet. Because I did see Follow the Mountain King and Hall of the Mountain King both actually at the table. So that one looked fascinating. Uh, again, it was just a prototype at this point. So we were not able to uh, like take a copy or actually play a full game. Uh, we did have a good meeting with them. So that was cool. We met with Kids Tables, not some, someone we had worked with before. Um, they literally asked for help with a game, which is awesome. Publisher went to them. 
who I someone was like, oh, no, no, Rec Raiders. This is a game that came out in 2019 or 2020, late 2019, 2020, and kind of um, got missed over, got mad, missed about. And when I noted that we're like, oh, you know, we're not always about the new hotness. We'll totally talk about all of the games. They were like, here, here you go. I think this game got overlooked and we want more press. So we're going to be checking out Rec Raiders from Kid Table Board Game, which we didn't even get to see. So that'll be a that'll be a surprise for me when I open that one up. Now, one of the most popular games of the show was Black Hole Rainbow. I wouldn't have touched this game with a 10 foot pole, except for the fact that I saw more people carrying around copies of this game than any other game at the con. This is a super light, take that quick playing game all about collecting crystals in the the seven rainbow colors, putting them onto your disc and then throwing those crystals into a black hole at the center of the table. It's a game where every turn you're going to draft two things, but then you can push things, sorry, black hole rainbows. That's plural. Uh, you're going to pass crystals. There's there's a chance where you can spend crystals to roll a die. It's a D20 that has three suns on it. And if you roll it, you get a coin. First player to get three coins wins the game. Super light party game. Passing things back and forth. The one part I really didn't like is there was card play where it's like, you know, pass three cards to this. Monopoly, everyone hand me your green crystals and all that. There was no timing on it. The first person to play a card, that card happened. The next player to play a card, that happened. And it was very chaotic. I totally get that people are into these kind of games, but it was so not for me. I like even if it has just been there was a rule for timing where you can only play cards in your own time. I would have liked it better, but all the power to them. This was an LGBT plus um, company, and and the game was definitely popular with the pride crowd that happened to be at Origins. So to be clear, they, this was so popular that they sold out their entire stock at five p.m. on Saturday. They didn't even yeah. make it to Sunday with their uh, with their stock. Um, caught a glimpse of Castle Panic Deluxe at the Fireside booth. Oh my God, am I jealous? Uh, like, wow, does that ever look awesome? There's miniatures that, that the bases turn. That way the miniatures can keep facing forward, but you can change their power levels. All miniatures for absolutely everything, including all four expansions. I don't even want to know the price, but man, it looked good. Um, similarly, there was a game found area of Origins where they were showing off various game founded games including the Deluxe Castles of Burgundy. Again, I am jealous. It looked so good. The thick tiles, the they looked like the geek up bits. Oh, it was so nice. Though, the person doing the demo of that did warn us that this was only a game for long-term fans because there were no player reference sheets and there was no iconography on the bottom of any of the tiles to explain what they do. Now, a woman anyone who owns Castle of Burgundy knows this is a problem with the base game, but it gets worse because like all the yellow buildings look the same. And instead you get a sideboard to put your yellow tiles on. So I got to say, like, it looks awesome. I am a longtime fan of Castles of Burgundy. I haven't even memorized what all the different icons mean, but I do dig it. Like it, it looked great. But if you're new, you probably don't want to dive that far in. Yeah. And for reference uh, for our listeners, $400 for Castle Panic Deluxe. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you you got to like the game a lot, but man, it looked good. If you got a store, if you got a store, yeah, then then you get that to show off the game. That that's that's your 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 put it by the catch register. No, it's, it's not really an impulse <laughs> buy. All right, next hit up Mind Clash. Tried their latest game, Astra. This is unique. Um, it's a game that's all dry erase markers, which I don't think I'd ever seen. And it's not a roll and write. Um, you are spending bits of stardust to dr- connect stars on sets of cards that are out on the table. Um, there's an area majority thing here. So w- the more stars you connect, the better chance of getting a reward was you could collect the cards. So the last person to fill with the last star got to keep the constellation, which was worth points. But then everyone else got a reward at the bottom of the card based on how many stars they filled in. So if like Sean filled in two stars, I filled in three, but D finished it. D would get the card. Sean would get his first pick a bonus. I would get my second bonuses include being able to hold more stardust and getting points really unique game and i've never seen a game that was like everything was dry erase like everything when you when you upgraded your things on your player board you just take them off you literally drew the lines to connect the stars really neat looking one very very different from anything else i played from mind clash um full disclosure mind class makes my number one game of all time so i am a fan of the company uh, Deanna loved this. She really enjoyed it. 
And so we brought a copy home. So I'll be talking more about that. Um, then I picked up two monstrosity expansions. I uh, got those for the kids. I got robots for Jen and cute creatures for Gwen. Um, find out why by listening to our monstrosity review, where I kids found some of the cards a little disturbing. So we wanted these lighter versions of the game. While some of that was going on, uh, the they had the cosplay competition going on. Now, this is something that's pretty new at Origins. Uh, cosplay, it's always been a part of the tabletop gaming world, but they are now making it more of a part of the show of Origins. Uh, this year, they had the Ogre's Tavern, which was a cosplaying area with uh, f- several uh, sponsoring uh, cosplayers there who were doing charity uh, donations for prints, as well as mm-hmm. posing for pictures. Rubber City Cosplay had an area for taking photographs with several backdrops up. Uh, there was a giant, uh, you know, fantasy tavern bar style thing you could take with some uh, inflatable weapons you could uh, <laughs> bash around if you wanted. Uh, and uh, as of Friday, we were seeing about 15 or so people interested who had signed up for the cosplay competition. Well, let me say by the end, by the time the cosplay competition hit, there were a lot more than 15 people there. Uh, Saturday was a huge burst of interest in the cosplay side of the show. The uh, competition itself was fantastic and a shout out to all the winners. Uh, The adult champion was the Magic the Gathering Samurai, who was a full samurai armored uh, costume self-made using scale mail that was made out of individual magic the gathering cards Mm -hmm. uh it was a fantastic uh show and uh some fantastic uh costumes we won't go into that too much here but if you are interested check out the dark elf lx instagram where i am slowly working through pictures i took of the various cosplays and competitors throughout the weekend Well, Sean was at that, met with Cosmos, and got the scoop on two unreleased games. So if you check my feed, you'll get some of the few pictures out there of My Island, which is the follow-up to My City. This is a legacy Euro that starts off super simple and gets more complex as you go. Unfortunately, that's about all I can share. So what I can tell you is on the first board, the first start of the game, you are on a stranded island and you need somewhere to live and you are doing the one input everyone plays the same so you flip a card everyone finds the same tile and your goal in the first game is to put huts on the shore and then you get points for putting huts on the shore and then people get points based on whoever put the most huts on the shore and someone wins that round then you open an element an envelope and things change and that's literally all i can tell you so that is my island the follow-up to my city they think it's going to be even bigger now my city was a big hit It was a surprise hit from Cosmos. Now, what more people are probably going to care about is the new Lord of the Rings adventure to Mount Doom. This is a cooperative game where the players collectively control the Fellowship of the Ring, trying to get Frodo to Mount Doom, which involves moving through various areas of Middle Earth. Um, Surprisingly, I haven't seen one of these in years. This is a roll and move with a twist. So you are going to pick two characters that you want to move that turn and two black bad guy dice and roll them then you're going to pick one of each of those to put on this little board that says who's going to move so you choose who of the fellowship you're going to move and then you're also going to um choose what bad thing's going to happen which is based on a bunch of the cards that are at the bottom and it's like running into trolls run into a nazgul and so on then you're going to add another companion die so another one of the fellowship and roll those pick which companion move pick which bad die then play out the turn. There's a whole combat system for rolling dice and so on. Really unique looking game. Fantastic artwork. Uh, Standees were great looking. Had some really cool mechanics where only characters advanced in front of Frodo can face the threats that come at them. And combat was so simple because you rolled a die that each side was a different member of the Fellowship. And if that member was available to protect Frodo, they protect Frodo. If they were behind, you failed and bad things happened which all had to do with the track that was how much courage the group had left. Looked very accessible, but still interesting enough for hobby gamers. But I think most Euro gamers, and I got to say, especially people who are like fans of World War of the Ring, 
aren't going to have much interest in this, but I think kids and families and people who are into lighter games and just Lord of the Rings fans like Tori and Kat are going to want this. This is their kind of game. This is a cottage game for them, right? Go roll the dice, see what happens to the fellowship. Yeah, no. And then uh, later that night, we tried uh, a new place, which turned out to be a chain that we weren't aware of. We weren't aware of initially, uh, but uh, Buca de Beppo, uh, which sounds like the family guy making fun of Italian speech, but is actually uh, yeah. the name of a very sort of kitschy and, and fun uh Store one of their one of their one of the rooms that we passed by on the way to our table had a giant uh bust of Pope John Paul II in the middle of the table under glass, yeah. Uh, paintings on pictures of uh, of Italian themed things all over the walls, that kind of, of kitschy oh, yeah. sort of restaurant, uh, with all family style sharing uh plate meals, but uh, ridiculously large but good food uh yep. i was surprised for for what turned out to be a chain restaurant uh this was no olive garden this was there was no. some really good food here yeah i was impressed the only problem was it was big heavy filling food which might have been a bad choice for walking back to the con center at the end of the day um for anyone who's local this was like a modern mother's to me is that that's what it reminded me of a lot all right day five main thing day five was about was stop by the booth that said come back sunday so what people may not be aware of, unless you're a content creator, is that is review copy day. This is when most publishers don't want to pay to ship product back to their warehouses and are most willing to give out copies to reviewers. So this is the big day where you get in line to talk to someone and there's three other people in front of you taking selfies and showing off their, their web pages and stuff. So it's a big day to us. Um, we tried to do most of that work ahead of time, but some of it we did have to do on Sunday. So up first was Inside Up Games, who we did work with in the past. Uh, you can check out our review of Goris Maximus. Um, there we checked out Block and Key and ended up bringing a copy home. This uh, amazed me because there is a, a, a speed-based dexterity game that is you play in pairs to try to make a pattern. It's called Laboka. I love this game. This is Laboka meets Mountains Out of Molehills because you get the cool 2D, 3D board where you have the raised area. You've got tiles you're drafting. These were actually ceramic tiles that you see the board from your place. And here's a card that shows a certain pattern. Well, as long as you can see that pattern from your side, you get to grab the card. Meanwhile, Sean would be sitting at a different angle and see completely different things from me and be trying to collect different things. So there was some really neat stuff to figure out what you're doing to other players to make sure they can't grab cards and you messing with their perspective without being able to turn the board. So that looks really cool. Um, we tried to get a copy of Earth because everyone is loving Earth. Earth. Earth might still be at the top of the board game geek hotness. It's just flying up the ranks, but they obviously were sold out. They were doing the, we had 150 copies on Friday and we had 80 copies on this day. And by Sunday, they only had 30. And they were gone in 10 minutes. Like th that was one of like, I'm saying that the black hole rainbows was the most popular game of the con earth might've been just people weren't walking around with copies. So that was a good meeting. Went good. Um, we headed over to CGE who we had met with at the gamma media event. So just kind of touch base. We did end up grabbing a copy of starship captains, which is just something I have wanted to try forever. We tried to fit a demo in all weekend, but it was a table that was always full. You could never sit down. So we're like, you know what? I love CG. I've never played a big game from them, and this game looked great, so we just grabbed a copy. We also got some cool promos, so when we get to our, you know, anniversary episode or whatever coming up where we like to do our little giveaways, we got some cool CGE promos to give out. Uh, next, while we were wandering about talking to people, I convinced Deanna to try Fantastic Factories from Deepwater Games. I'm like, Dee, you got to try this. She's like, well, it doesn't look like much, and I'll admit, it doesn't look like much. And I feel very justified because after the first second round, I think it was where she dropped her second card in the discard pile, she was sold. She loved it. And uh, now working with Deepwater Games, which is awesome. So we did get a review copy to go. Personally, I'm really excited about getting the expansions. Uh, one in particular, they like to call the Gamers expansion that turns it from a, a gateway welcoming engine builder into more of a heavier game. Well, we'll see how the base game goes. Maybe we'll reach back out to them and work something out. 
Now, at one point, we did run into the Hungry Gamer, who is uh, my co-moderator for the Board Game and Reviewer group on Facebook, someone I've only interacted with online, so hung out for a bit, also got to meet, um, oh, I'm so sorry, it's one of the Kims, there's two Kims I talked to, I think it was Kim Breeze, sorry if I got the wrong Kim, uh, at the same time. So we headed over to the Bezier Games booth and tried out Scram. This was a very solid partner-based uh, tableau shedding. So you have a bunch of cards in front of you that represent animals that are raiding your campsite, and you want to scare them away. You want them to scram. And you do that while working with your partner, trying to shed cards from the table. So you're drawing cards from, from the deck and swapping the cards that are in front of you, and there's all these rules where different animals have special abilities. We can flip cards over. Uh, extremely cute. The art was awesome. I uh, I sent Sean a picture of the otter card from the game because Sean has an obsession with otters. Uh, really neat looking game. That, that that seemed really cool. Now, this is not one that's not out yet. This was just a preview, a prototype. But that's one to look forward to. I, I think that one's going to do well. Um, I like Deanna's pointing out in the chat here. The one thing that did seem odd is when you played three players, Instead of playing with a partner, you only have eight critters to get rid of instead of whatever it was, six each or something, 12 between us. And it just seemed odd because the play order was like me, third player, D, third player, me, third player, D. And we kept messing it up, as did the person doing the demo. I think it was 10 between us and they had eight. OK, there was something Lo really great looking game. This looked like another good barbershop bar, casual game night, you know, New Year's game, having some adult beverages kind of game. Yeah, interestingly, Board Game Geek has already uh, decided that it is best at four and six, not three. <laughs> yeah, I, that doesn't surprise me. Like, I, I would say that at the point for us playing it. Unfortunately, there were three of us. Um, while we were there, um, Maglev Metro was set up next to us. So I, I bumped over there to take a look at that. Technically, they were selling the expansion, which I apologize. I don't even have the expansion for or sorry, the name for. But they were trying to show off the expansion for Maglev Metro. This is a game I've been curious about. Both Deanna and I are uh, train game fans, and this seemed like a very cool one. So it starts off, this is monorails. You're, you're doing magnetic rails, and it starts off at first, you're just delivering robots, but you want to upgrade your company so that eventually you can start delivering people and making more money. Uh, this was, I don't even know how to describe it. You were delivering the robots, and when you did, you then got to upgrade parts of your company which then you could deliver more robots or you could build longer routes. And there was like eight different actions you could take. Nice, heavy train game, which had some neat stuff I've never seen before. One of the things I loved was it used acrylic tiles that were clear. So you could actually build your route over someone else's and they showed up. Like you could see my route went over Blue's route. And it just looked awesome with these acrylic tiles. Um, awesome looking little trains that you could actually stand the meeples up in. This looked great. Um, look kind of similar to Steam, but way more player control. Like you had so much player agency on this where you could rearrange your robots on your board to be better at different things. I, I look great. I'm, I'm totally sold on Maglev Metro. I think uh, for Deanna, besides Distilled, was the one game she most wanted to bring home. Now, at this point, we do not have a relationship with Bezier. Maybe something we can work on. Would love to check that out. If you're listening, Bezier, we would love to look at Maglev Metro. And the new uh, expansions for it are Mechs and Monorails, yep. uh, as well as the Maglev Maps Volume 1, both released this year. Yeah, yeah, because there was this whole thing where you had these mechs that took up three slots, and that was part of the expansion. We didn't do that. Um, Stop by the Gloomhaven booth. Cephala Fair was showing off the new role-playing game. We could have got to play Gloomhaven the RPG, and mainly showing off the miniatures. And yes, they had copies of Frosthaven for sale at the, the booth. So that was good to see. Lots of people doing demos of the RPG. Uh, we did stop by Indie Boards and Cards and got a demo of Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition, which I have been itching to try since it was announced and was just as amazing as I thought it would be. Uh, this is Terraforming Mars meets Race for the Galaxy and all the right things. It's like the best of both games mashed together. Um, 100% sold, though I'll admit we did not buy a copy <laughs> at the show, but I will admit we were tempted. We were bringing enough other stuff home at the time. Uh, we did pick up a bunch more review copies. I'm not going to get into all of them. There's pictures. behind. You can see the stack behind me. You can check out my social media posts. Some of them include Holotype from Brexworks, Hamburg and Marrakesh from Queen Games, two Steffenfelds, uh, Hamburg being the update to Bruges, one of the most popular felds. Uh, the Stuff a Legend from 3WS Games, 
Dubious from Arcane Wonders, and many more. Like honestly, there is we 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 have a year's worth of content to share with you. It it will all be coming. Yeah, there are going to be a lot of reviews, unboxings, unpackagings, and more coming to your YouTube streams and uh, every other way you pay attention to us in the coming <laughs> months. Now, we celebrated the end of Origins in, in a way that got dirty looks from Sean and uh, what, what are we doing? And, and D going, uh, I, I guess. And we walked down to Jenny's. I should say up because it was up North High Street. Down to Jenny's. If you haven't had Jenny's, you need to try it. It is a, a Columbus highlight. Jenny's is an ice cream company that makes fresh ice cream with very interesting flavors. It is absolutely fantastic. So we, 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 we stopped by Jenny's. Then we stopped by the amazing toy shop called the Big Fun, which was such a trip down many, memory lane. I think any toy from my childhood, I could have found there. Yes, their prices were a little more than you expect to pay for retro toys, but their selection made it worth it. Uh, if you are into toys or if you're just like, you know, you had Transformers and G.I. Mm -hmm. Joes or more importantly, Micronauts or Battlestar Galactica action figures, you owe it to yourself to at least walk around. Uh, next, we hung out at Bernard's Tavern. Um, this was, again, something I had learned. I have to thank uh, the misdirected Mark Gem team for discovering this hole in a wall complete dive bar that has fantastic fried cheese curds and is super welcoming. We, I, I met the best bartender I've ever met in my entire life. That guy was awesome. Awesome bartender who was telling us part of his life story, listening to what we were doing, was curious as to what we were doing, kept our drinks filled. Uh, just fantastic place. You wouldn't go in it. If you were walking down North High Street and you're a bunch of gamers, you're not going to look at this place and go, let's go there. But we did with the Gem team, and I'll be back every year. This is a great just sit and chill place. Um, good beers, and we tried out um, what I'm going to call my surprise, my biggest surprise of Origins. So when we're at the Smirk and Dagger booth, we're grabbing Boo, we're grabbing Show Boo, and then then um, suddenly turn around and and the the, the I'm drawing a Kurt Covert. Do I have the right name? Kurt. I might have the wrong name here. Turns around and is like, "You'll enjoy this too," and it hands us the Deadlies, and I'm like, "What's this?" He's like, "Uno for gamers," and I'm like. Okay, sure. Thanks, Kurt. <laughs> I'm glad I got these other games off you. Um, so at this point, we haven't made any agreements on about unboxings or anything. So I'm like, all right, this is a bonus game. So we we walk up there and we bring this with us and I crack it open. I read the rules while Deanna's doing stuff uh, like putting business cards in a spreadsheet and work stuff, right? Wrapping up the end of the day work stuff. We break this game out. We shuffle out a hand. And I am totally won over. This is this is a game about the seven deadly sins. That's what the deadlies are. And each of the seven cards, each of the seven suits does something different. And your goal, it's a deck shedding game. You want an empty hand. There's the Yonu part. But that's really the only Uno part. Now, when you're playing your cards, you can either play all cards of the same color, all cards of the same number, or all cards in a row, one through seven. Now, when you play all cards the same color, they're all going to be the same suit. They all do the same thing. So that doesn't matter. When you play a set of numbers, you're going to pick which card on top. So which of the colors, which of the suits happens. And when you play a run, it's the highest number card that goes off. Now, each of these cards does something, which is like, if you play Lust, you, you're, you can each, your opponent can not take part. They're not Lusty. Or they can take part and you each discard a card. If they discard Lust, it makes your opponent draw three cards. Um, another one is Wrath. Your opponent draws two cards. Then if they play Wrath, you have to draw two cards. And if the Wrath keeps going back and forth, you both end up mitt full of cards. Um, greed was about pushing your luck, where you just keep flipping cards until you get a pair. If you don't get a pair, you win, and you get to, you get to reduce your hand quality. Some brilliant stuff in this was the fact there's no player elimination. So what happened is once you voided your hand once, you then turned your clock down from six to four. You now start with a hand to four. If you win again, you now turn your clock down to two. You just have a hand to two. If you get rid of those, you win. And the game ends. Whoever first person to do it does it. Fantastic mechanic. And the fact the game escalated because you didn't have six cards. Like as you got down, everyone had less cards and it was even more frantic. Brilliant game. Like, like uh, we played three times, I think, already. Yeah. I, th I think like, you know how we're like, we probably play games at least five times. That's not going to be a problem with this one. <laughs> so yeah, if you're into like quick playing rapid fire card games, if you're in Windsor, expect to see this one out at the next barbershop bar event. 
yeah, no, this one was was super easy to learn. Didn't have any of the uh, the the strange sort of oh wait what about and you know when we when we got into the tome there were a few little hurdles that that were tried that were mm. hard to get used to because of being used to other card playing games. Whereas this one there was none of that. Everything was super obvious. You mm-hmm. just played. Yeah, we really got a different feel from Smirk and Dagger being a big company with a playtest. A cadre probably of people who play test and game developers like it's so polished. Yep. Uh, eventually, we ended up back at Bear Burger. Now that downtown and the convention center was pretty much a ghost town because mm-hmm. that's what happens by about six p.m. on Sunday. Um, I tried the fried chicken, the milk fried chicken, and I gotta say, if you go to Bear Burger, get a burger. Like, like stick with. I want to say meat. Uh, chicken still meat, but but it get a burger. What they do best. Yeah, it is what they do best. Get a grass fed beef burger. While you're there, or if you're into it, get a get one of the the no meat alternatives. And that was it for our final day of Origins. But no, we hadn't gone home yet. Yeah, bonus we, day, Origins stayed, bonus. We stayed extra, as you know, because even though it was, uh, you know, the show ends at four o'clock. Uh, there's still a lot of things to get done, getting the box, getting everything back to the room, sorting everything, getting everything packed up, you know, getting your room back together uh, by the uh, having dinner. You don't want to be driving home until 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night and crossing mm-hmm. the border late at night. It just makes sense to make that uh, Sunday relaxing and then have a nice, easy drive back on Monday. Yep. So we packed up. Managed to fit it all on one cart, although with Sean's bonus cart, it might not have all fit on one <laughs> cart. At least the games all fit on one cart. Uh, we did have one final stop, uh, which is Melt. So we discovered this, the 2019, we discovered Melt. Oh, uh, it's Melt Grilled something. I forget Melt, but it, and everyone knows that it's Melt. Uh, they used to be downtown. We discovered it last time on Monday out of the way of town. We're like, oh my God, we got to go back next time we're in Columbus. Unfortunately, the downtown location um, has closed. So I Googled it and I knew it was a chain. They had another location. It was, I don't know, a, a 10, eight minute drive kind of on our way. Like we went, like took a couple of highways. It was on the way home. It was in a, in a weird, like built up mini mall kind of area. And wow, not like the one downtown. Now the one downtown was like a hip, cool bar filled with gamers with pinball machines and arcade games you could play and kind of sticky floors and popcorn. Or, you know, it was either popcorn or, or um, peanuts on the floor, like very casual place. Whereas this felt like like walking into an Applebee's or something like yeah. that. And um, it's, it's Melt there, Bar and Grilled. There, Melt Bar and Grilled. Um, they look like they have 30 taps, but only about eight were working. Um, it just was very sterile compared to the Melt I remembered. But their grilled cheese is still absolutely amazing. Like like some of the best food we had all weekend, at least for me, I got something called the Dude Abides, which was a grilled cheese with fried cheese, um, mozzarella triangles with a giant meatball in the middle and then three other kinds of cheese. Like it, it just I love melt. Totally worth the drive out of our way just to get that meal. Uh, there are nine, I believe, a location or nine or 12 locations in Ohio only. It's an Ohio chain. Um, so don't, yeah, don't be just, looking for them elsewhere, but they are all across uh, all throughout parts of Ohio. See, that's cool. It, it's so good. Like, really, it's so good. You you wouldn't believe grilled cheese could taste this good. Uh, drove home. Uh, not as nice as the drive down due to bands of rain, multiple bands of rainstorms. Um, never enough that I felt the need to pull over, but there were definitely some parts where I was just following the person in front of me. Um, thankfully got home safe and sound and, uh, no problem going through customs except for a, a person kind of, uh, I would say probably disgusted by <laughs> the amount of, uh, value of board games we were bringing back, but they didn't pull us over. So that was all good. Uh, no, you know, final thoughts on the con. So what was, uh, what for you was your biggest surprise of this con? What caught you off guard? I think like like game wise, it was definitely that the the deadlies was was definitely the game I was not expecting to be <laughs> nearly as good as it was. So thanks, Kurt, for handing that over. So that was cool. I I I just how different it felt from 2019. Like like times have obviously changed, and and there were things I expected to be able to do that we didn't get to do because they didn't exist. So the big thing is it just Origins. I don't think is the second biggest game con anymore. 
Like it's just not as big a deal as it used to be. There were a lot of big name publishers that were not there, but publishers we expected to be there that we enjoyed going to. Like the Mayfair booth was always awesome. And you would get Catan things. And if you got a full set of wood, sheep, wheat, and ore, and whatever all the Catan things are, you traded them in for stuff. Now, I know Mayfair is no longer around, for example, but um, like Daily Magic Games, we love Valeria games. They weren't there. I wouldn't be in love with Valeria if I didn't do a Daily Magic demo at Origins, if I didn't play Valeria. Rio Grande usually has an area outside the hall, which is your secret to free food. You just go over at the right time of day during the con and you demo their games and they bring out tacos and pizza and you can get a free meal in the middle of the day. Well, they weren't even there. No Rio Grande games. For the role players, no Wizards of the Coast, no Paizo. Like neither of the big RPG companies were even present. While there was Pathfinder Society games there, they were put on by a Columbus group. And while there were D&D games there, they were put on by Baldman Games, not Wizards of the Coast. So I think the big thing was just, it was smaller. It, it wasn't the origins I remember. It wasn't quite the press event that I expected it to be. Yeah, un unfortunately, I think one thing we have discovered, and I don't think this is a result of the lockdowns, but this is something that has been developing for a long time and maybe uh, condensed in some way uh, throughout or du during the lockdown, is that the number of conventions has grown to a point and the importance yeah. of various conventions has grown, grown to points where publishers have to make decisions. It's simply too expensive to go to all the cons. Yeah. And they are making... Uh, decisions as to which one is going to be the best bang for their buck. Uh, and you can't blame them for that. Yeah, it's definitely, and, and I get it. And and I don't know what the replacement for origins might be where everyone is instead. And I kind of feel like it's just kind of diluted over all the cons. Like if you want to see Rio Grande, you got to go to this con, but if you want to see Watsi, you got to go to this con. And if you want to go see um, daily magic, they're at this con. Which is hard as a as a content creator who likes to work with a number of different people and likes games from different companies. Like, like yeah, I would say we're a Daily Magic fanboy, and I, I felt they were missed. Yeah. Uh, but we got to meet with the op, who we love working with. So I, I think the biggest surprise was how it has changed. And the other thing that Deanna's pointing here in the chat is also legit, is it used to be Origins was the board gate con, Gen Con was the RPG con. And I think that's shifting. I think Gen Con now is as much a board game con as an RPG con. And I think the board game publishers are realizing we need to release there instead of Origins because it's bigger. More people go. Like, that hasn't changed. Gen Con's still the big game. Yeah. But that's also not to say there was no one here. Like, I saw people complaining that Origins was pointless this year, and I didn't feel that at all. We hooked up with a ton of awesome publishers. I tried an odd... And a huge number of games, and I brought home a big number of games that I'm excited to play. I didn't feel it was too small. Unfortunately, I think for people who had already started going to cons uh, earlier than we did, I can see how they might have found it uh, pointless, because if they are going to other cons, especially Gen Con, there's really no benefit for them to be at Origins. If they're going to be at Gen Con, if they've been at Gamma, if they're going right. to PAX, origins is in fact an extra for them uh but because this was our first con back uh it was absolutely very valuable for us and yeah. uh cemented a lot of great relationships plus i just origins feels like home there is something about being at a game convention where any social anxiety i have goes away because i know everyone around me has something in common they love board games they love playing games or rpgs depending on what part of your hall you are I'm one of those people that can easily float between Big Bar on two and the exhibition hall and feel equally comfortable with both groups of people. And I still, excuse me, and I still loved that small con feel while being at a big con. Maybe it wasn't as big as it used to be, but it's still a big con. All right. Well, uh, what was what was your game of the con? What was what was the big for you? I mean, we've talked about how Castle Panic and and you know the Earth and. Uh, the the black holes um game but for you what was your game of the con uh most excited about i think is distilled getting to meet the designer talk to the designer get to see it the game trays inserts just how well it seems the theme is integrated with it just uh, that one's definitely up there um kapow looks great but i haven't played it yet 
Um, the, the Maglev Metro looks awesome too. I really want to check that out, but that wasn't like a new hit. Uh, but distilled is probably the one I'm most excited to bring home out of everything behind me. I am really looking forward to trying out again Artemis Project because I like the game it's based on. And the Endangered, I have heard from many people, is like the best co op game out there. So, getting check out more games from Mark. Um, I can't wait for our next trip out of town, Deanna and I, because now we have three new abstract strategy two player games that we can easily pack up to play. So, I and and I gotta say, um, Travis from Queen really sold me. Oh, I said Artemis Project. See, I get those messed up. Artemis Odyssey. Sorry, Artemis Odyssey is the one based on Ad Astra. But yeah, uh, Marrakesh, uh, the, the latest Steffenfeld, the newest Cube Tower game. Uh, the, Travis sold me hard on that one. He would not let me leave the con without it. We'll put it that way. He is excited. This is the biggest release for Queen in a long time, according to him. And and he is someone who judges their games and knows that not every game they make is for everyone. So really looking forward to checking that one out. But I didn't get to play it. So it's hard to be excited. Say, game of the con was this when I haven't played it yet. I'm really looking forward to uh, getting uh, Kapow, uh, Marvel Dice Throne, and uh, the the new Sentinels um, yeah. onto the table. Those are those are the three that are are really kind of uh, jumping out for me. Uh, so uh, if you if we had to do it again, what do you think you would do differently if you uh, were were back were were able to go and try it all over again, all all, all right. our five the days? The big thing that I feel we messed out on was the social aspect, getting to meet and greet, not necessarily the fans, but like other gamers and and possibly getting new fans out of it. We did not do a lot of socializing. It wasn't just the three of us at the end of the day sitting, having a meal together. I didn't do the hangout at Big Bar on two and run into Playpool. I didn't do the the be in the elevator with people and being like, oh, what did what, you see today? What did you play today? We were so laser focused on trying to make new relationships and reestablish old relationships and make contacts and and honestly rep the brand that I feel we missed out on the just hanging out with other gamers and the organic growth that we might have got out of that, thinking of it like for the brand, but also just like I missed the the chat. Now, part of that is a lot of our con friends, you know how after going to cons multiple times, you make con friends. A lot of them did not make it to the con this year. Or chose not to go. I, I don't know which it is. Uh, for example, there's people in my ch in our chat room tonight, like Danielle, who I've, I met at the con and we've hung out at the con, weren't there this year. The The entire gem team was pretty much there. We did run into Angela. Angela's awesome. Did not get to play her new Tales from the Loop scenario, which just kind of bums me out. But we, we didn't run into as many people. And we just didn't network that way. We networked with publishers instead of, instead of potential fans, I guess is the way to word it. Or just fellow gamers. And I, and I felt... And it didn't click in until like we're sitting there Sunday and I'm like, no, what we didn't do. We didn't do like, yeah, we went to Brucadia and we sat at our table and we played a game and we ate some pizza and played some video games. But we never talked to the table next to us and said, hey, what are you playing over there? Like that aspect of the con just didn't happen this time. Now, I talked about this during one of our breaks, so this wouldn't have been on the podcast earlier. But I think part of it is, is this was a catch up year for us. We had to focus on there were so many different games we missed out on in the last three years that we're kind of focused on finding out about those. Well, all right. Well, there you have a good overview, a great long overview of our perspective of Origins Game Fair 2023. Did you attend Origins this year? How was your con experience? And was there anything you saw that we just seemed to completely miss? Let us know about it in the comments or hit us up on social media. Now, before we wrap this up, just a reminder that we are actually here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, all you have to do is stop by tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. There it goes. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Now, originally I was going to cut this segment, but due to our extended time off, uh, due to my dad's passing, we had a lot of game plays that happened pre-Origins to talk about, in addition to a couple plays since getting home. So before leaving on our trip, uh, the game that got the most played was Outsmarted. Now, we played a full six-ring three-player game with Deshaun and I. We got to see the final round and how it worked, which was interesting. I'll, I'll answer a bunch of questions rapid fire at the end, which was so difficult. At the end of it, where I think it was a, you had one minute to answer three questions in multiple different categories. 
Uh, we then played a four player game over at Brenda's with the kids. And then I played three games at the barbershop bar. Um, our last barbershop bar, we actually gave away a copy of the game to the player with the highest score at the end of the night. And that was a lot of fun. Um, plus, we tried out the remote play options in that game. Yeah, the, well, not perfect. The remote play is solid enough that even those people who can't be present can take part in the fun. Though the interface for using the board and moving your piece around is rough and should probably have a tablet to use properly because even zooming in on the phone made it difficult. Yeah. Now, overall, the way this game stands, everyone I played it with that likes trivia loves it. Everyone who doesn't like trivia hasn't really been won over. It is a trivia game. Now, what I did find is a couple of players, though, that hated the categories in Trivial Pursuit, like Ian in particular from the CG Realm, someone who co-hosts the Barbershop Bar events is like, yeah, I love Trivial Pursuit, except for the fact that I have to answer sports questions. Well, the main benefit this game has is that you can skip the, the, the sports and pick your own categories. Now, as for Outsmarted, we'll be talking more about that one. We're hoping to do a full review next episode where you can hear more about it. Now, one thing I do want to ask is, did you play anything at the Barbershop Bar? I was so busy doing Outsmarted all night. I did. Um, what did I play? I don't even <laughs> See, remember. See, this is why it's been so long, and I yeah. didn't want to wait another week. It has been a while. Um, I, I, yeah, let me double check. I, I'm sure I played something. Um, but again, it's been quite a while since that. Uh, oh, Goblin Vaults, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, Goblin Vaults was a fun game that we kind of all figured out and uh, and sat down and played uh, played through. Uh, just a fun little card game uh, that was uh, it's in the role player universe of games. Uh, so speaking of next week's reviews, we also plan on covering Trick Draw, the other game that we got in some plays of before the trip down south. Of note during that play was trying the shout out variety, which seems like an optional rule for players who are comfortable with the game for a shootout ver a variant, which for which is a really fun uh, variant. Uh, once you're, you're comfortable with the game and you're able to uh, plan ahead in it. Yeah, because what this one does is after someone hits 10 gold, you play one more round. Then the person with the highest gold wins. And to fit the shootout theme, any players that have the same total exactly take each other out and aren't part of contention. So you could actually win the game with only five gold if the other two players are playing three players and you wipe them out. Now, the last pre-Origins game is we cracked open our very shiny copy of a Letterati Deluxe Edition. This is a cooperative real-time word game. I would say Bananagrams for Gamers. I love the theme of this. You are playing li rogue librarians who are trying to piece together books from various different pages while trying to prevent the Illiterati from burning all the books. Uh, this was really neat where you get a bunch of word tiles. And everyone gets a set of word tiles. There's a few in the middle you can share, and everyone has to form words with their tiles. And if you manage to use up all the tiles, great. Otherwise, those words, letters you didn't use get burned. And if you burn enough books, you lose the game, enough, enough letters. Now, once you get through the first round, which is a little hard trying to use all your letters, you then start to focus on binding books by forming specific words. So Sean might need to bind books a uh, total of eight letters that are all animals, whereas Deanna might be trying to bind a book that's total of so many letters that are all, uh, what was one of the ones I had that was hard? It was, it was tech company names um, and, and so on. And then once you burn, you, you bind a red book, you then try to do a blue one. And then this one's more about rhyming words or um, I'm drawing a blank on various grammatical terms right now. Homophones. Homophones. And, yeah, there you go. That'll work. And antonyms. Synonyms. And uh, uh, whatever. You're trying to do that. And then once everyone has completed two books, you then put out a harder one, the final book, but every player has to complete it at once. So you all need whatever, seven homophones between all of the players. Uh, the time, the timer this time was working for us, even though you had trouble with it during the unboxing. Yeah. Uh, I helped if you, I found it if you flipped it over and gave it a tap on the, uh, on the table as you put it down, uh, it was uh, generally urged to keep working for us. Yes. Yeah, no, I think it only stopped once during our game. I so far impressed. I, I, I'm not a huge word game fan, but this one worked well. Uh, it, it is kind of bad for quarterbacking. I will say for a cooperative game. 
There is a, a, the tendency to try to help other players form words. Though I found you're usually because of the timer focused on your own letters more than anyone else. And like, does anyone have an S? I did like being able to pass it first. And I got to say, it's awesome to see people still discovering new ways to make Scrabble style games interesting. All right. Well, then we have uh, all the games we played and the demos we did at Origins, which we covered just earlier. And we are not going to repeat here. You can thank us later. Yes. Then finally, last night, once the kids got home and were excited to see all the new games, I did sit down with both of them and played a couple games. Uh, what I played first was show, or we played Shobu and Boop. Now, both these are two-player games. So what we did with Boop is I played Gwen, then Gwen played Jen, then I played Jen. So we all got to try the game. Uh, these are both smirk and laughter games uh, that we did bring home from the con. Boop is now the cutest game I own, I think, uh, in all ways. This is a game about cats bouncing on a bed that actually has a quilted bed place piece that is the board that you put on the flipped over box that makes a bed. And then you have meeples of kittens and cats in two different colors. Uh, this, this is a great game where you jump a cat onto the bed and then it boops any adjacent cats and they all move one square away. You start off with eight kittens. If you get a row of three kittens, you get to upgrade those three kittens to cats. Then the goal is to get three cats in a row to win. Fantastic game, abstract strategy that sounds dead simple, but man, when you sit down, the spatial reasoning required in this game is, is significant, I would say. It is not an easy game. Um, Gwen really liked it, my oldest daughter. Now, Jen was thought it was fun to boop things around, but had a hard time getting into the actual um, the play of it, like, like playing well. Now, what Jen did love is those kitten meeples stack really well. So if you want some nice stacking meeples, they will probably enjoy it. Um, this was a fun game. I love the theme. Glad we brought it home. Yeah, this one looks like it's going to be fun. And again, as we said, the table presence is just unbeatable. And then Shobu. Um, this was just Gwen and I. Jen went to bed. I really dig this. What I didn't realize is these two games are related. I didn't get that at the con. It ends up that Boop is actually a follow-up to Shobu. Um, I don't know if it's the same designer or design team, but the one actually evolves from the other. Now, I actually preferred Shobu. I thought it was more interesting. No, it's not nearly as cute. What you have here are four four by four boards. So you have four grids in two different colors, light and dark. So two light boards, two dark boards. You put a rope between each set of them. Then you're going to put a row of white rocks at the top, black rocks at the bottom, black goes first. What you're going to do on your turn is you're going to make two moves. First is a passive move. The second is an aggressive move. Passive move has to be on the boards on your side of the rope. You move a piece, two pieces, two spaces, up to two spaces, sorry. Whatever way you want, diagonal, straight, orthogonal, it doesn't matter, up to two pieces, spaces. Then you make an aggressive move. You now move a second piece that has to be on the opposite colored board. This can be aggressive. This can push and bump other players' stones. The goal? Push off all the opponent's colors on one of the four boards. That's it. I just taught you how to play. Trust me, I know it doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense, but if you saw it in front of you, it makes total sense. It, it just, this game just works. This is a brilliant game design. All right. Well, the unboxing video is all right. No. Where are That's, you? I'm, I'm somewhere else. Yeah, sorry. Nope. <laughs> no <laughs> unboxing video yet. Go away. Ignore me. <laughs> John's like, we've been talking too long. I'm tired. I feel like it's day it's Sunday at Origins at 4 30. Yeah, I still I still haven't tried boop yet. So all right. Well, how about a look ahead? How what do we have coming up next? Uh what are you gonna pick from the stacks and stacks and piles and mounds so, behind you? So here's the thing. I am extremely excited about everything we brought home. But I can't ignore the fact that before we left for the con, we already had a pile of obligation. So at this point, as far as reviews are concerned, I'm probably not going to review any of the ones that we have behind you right away. Now, because I want to FIFO things as best I can. So we're going to try to FIFO things out, maybe mixing in a bit of Origins new hotness along with the older stuff. So the big one we did want to get out right away was the At The Ready expansion for Disney Sorcerer's Arena. This doesn't hit the public until Gen Con, and I think it'd be awesome for us to get the first review out there before anyone else. We're probably going to bump that one to the top. 
So the unboxing video for this is already out on YouTube, so you can check out what you'll be getting when it does come to retail. And now what we're going to do with the origin stuff is start recording unboxing videos and starting to play these games. So the reviews are going to take a bit. Like we said many times, we try to play our games about five times each um, before putting out reviews. So we have to play them. So now we did get in a few games at the con and I've already started playing games with the kids. So th that work has already started. Now, Deanna is really looking forward to trying out Distilled. And I plan on bringing out some of these games to our next barbershop bar event. And for any locals, that is now scheduled for the 22nd of July. So we will be trickling this out, but you're going to have to sit through some reviews of uh, an escape box and then some other stuff from, from Escape Welt, um, Outsmarted, Trick Draw, the Worlds of Viticulture from Stonemeyer. Like I said, we're going we're gonna to try to get through some of that obligation stuff before we deep dive the pile behind me. No matter how excited I am for my new hotness. So uh, I'll also be posting images from the con on my socials and Mo will likely be reposting uh, on them on uh, his as well. So do keep an eye out for that. If you are interested in the cosplay side in particular, uh, Dark Elf LX on Instagram is the place to check out that as I slowly work through my camera roll. And of course, watch our socials. Uh, we're going to be working through these piles. And as I share them, please, if you have an opinion on these games, let us know. Let us know what you thought. Is Boop right for you or was it just too silly a theme? Is Distilled as good as I'm expecting it to be? Let us know. Now, this show and even our trips to cons wouldn't be possible without our Patreon patrons, our VIP guests. So here's a quick shout out to five of them. First off, a big welcome to our newest Patreon patron. Welcome and thank you, Chris Leary. And welcome, Chris. Donna, thank you, Pax. Good to see you in the chat. Valentine Pache, thank you. Brian Sheehan, thanks, Brian. You would have loved some of those war game tables. Ron F., thank you, Ron. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means the vendor hall is closed. We're wrapping up the gaming thing. It's 1 a.m. Your feet hurt. It's time to go to bed and dream about games and, and start planning for next year, I guess. <laughs> Though the vendor hall is closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Dig what you heard tonight? please consider stopping by patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and tipping your bellhop. Well, that's all for us tonight. Thank you lobbyists for joining us live and be sure to stick around for the penthouse suite after show for the tabletop bellhop gaming podcast. I'm Sean and I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.